Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome to Know Your Gear Live QA podcast number 264. And uh, I hope you guys all had a good week. And you may be noticing something different right away. <laughs> uh, I am not wearing my traditional Johnny Cash all black because, you know, that's always the cool way to go. Today I'm wearing a little color and we'll be talking about that since now I own a shirt that isn't black. I thought I'd wear one. <laughs> yes, a lot of you may have to adjust the colors of your screen. And no, you are not mistaken. This uh, is very bright and I am glowing. So, luckily, as my wife said today, that I uh, brushed the pool, and so she's like, well, at least you got a little sun. <laughs> so she said, well, uh, whatever. <laughs> All right, we're going to talk about it. What we're going to do is I'm going to share the, the shirt and the shirt story. We're going to start. That's how we're starting the episode today. I hope you guys understand. First of all, here is the shirt. Let me show you the front. The front says, McKnight Trucking. It's even got a little Know Your Gear little logo on the door. I don't know how to point to it. There you go, for those who are looking. This is a cool dump truck. The back of the shirt, <laughs> I did a couple of practice twirls and it didn't work out. So look at that. I just took a picture of it. Okay, so just so you know, we take big dumps. <laughs> this is my official, unofficial McKnight Trucking dump truck t-shirt that was sent to me by the viewer Jeff with one F. He, he made this shirt for me. In, as an homage to the I Drive a Dump Truck story. What's funny was I could not, for the life of me, and I did spend way too much time, more time than I had, probably had, looking for the time when we talked about the dump truck story on the podcast. So I'm going to repeat the story. So some of you guys may have heard this. I'm going to repeat it again so that way it's official out there so that some of you don't act confused why I'm wearing a bright fluorescent yellow shirt that says... We also, just so you know, we take big dumps. So the story goes like this. Uh, as when I first started YouTubing, <laughs> being a YouTuber, what have you, uh, more, more importantly, when I first started working from my home, that's really what the change was, right? So I was running business out of my house as a YouTuber and, and other things. And what happened was a coffee shop opened up behind my house. And so I was like, oh, I'll go get a coffee. It's like in the middle of the day. It's, you know, some of you guys work from home, you know, it, it's it's a little claustrophobic sometimes. So I get in the car and I drive to the the uh, mom and pop independent <laughs> independent uh, coffee shop, and I order the same thing I always order as uh, large coffee, uh, drip coffee with cream, no sugar. And so I get to the window, and the girl who's very pleasant, she's like, "Oh, how are you doing today?" And I said, "Good." And she says, "What are you doing?" And I said, "Oh, I'm just taking a break from work." And she goes, "What do you do?" And I don't know why I had trouble with this, but I was like. Um, I'm, I, I do YouTube and she's like, Oh, you do YouTube. And she was so excited. And she, and I said, yeah. And she's like, how many subscribers you have? And I think it was like 200,000 or something, or I think it was before I got to a quarter million mark or something. I was like, Oh, 200,000. She's like, Oh, oh, wow. What do you, what are you YouTube about? And I go, Oh, guitars. And then I could see the disappointment in her face of like, Oh, he's not like a real YouTuber or something. She didn't say that. She's very pleasant, but you know, you get the vibe. I don't know why, but I never had anybody ask me what I did before, like in a casual environment. <laughs> so, um, I don't know, a couple days later, maybe it was the next day, I don't remember, I went back, got another coffee, another person, and I didn't realize, like, this is their shtick. They, they uh, ask you how you're doing and what you're doing and what you do. It's like they just small talk you. So, the, the uh, person behind the ca uh, counter says, uh, what are you doing? And I said, and that day, actually, I remember this better now. Um, that day, just to give you a frame of reference, I was driving across town to Atomic Guitar Works to film a Sharp of My Axe episode. So I I was in the car, and I had all the camera r r gear and tripods. And they go, oh, what are you doing today? And I go, oh, I'm going to film on the other side of town. And they go, oh, what, what are you filming? I go, oh, it's a video for my channel. And they go, oh, you, you, what are you doing? I go, YouTube. And they were like, oh, you do YouTube? And then it's, it just becomes a conversation. It's so strange. Like, oh, how do you make money on YouTube? That's the part that's missing from the story, by the way. It's not telling people that I do YouTube. It's always the next question is like, how many subs do you have? How do you make money? Do you make money? How does it work? <laughs> you know, it becomes a very awkward conversation. Um, 
So here's why it goes off the rails. So that's a, I tell my wife what happens, and the, she knows that my normal instinct is to disengage when I see people. So, so she says, just tell people you're in media. media. And I go, oh, I'm in media. And I go, that's a good idea. So third time, just a couple days later, maybe a week later, I go to the coffee shop, get a coffee, pull up to the window. They ask me again, what are you doing? How are you doing? I said, oh, I'm... Uh, off, I'm, I think I was done for the day or something or whatever I was doing. And they go, what do you do? And I go, oh, I'm in media. And and, the, and they go, oh, you're in media? And I go, yeah. And they go, for who? And I go, I didn't think there was going to be a follow-up question. You know, when you prep a lie, sometimes you have to you have to think about this. I'm not a very good liar, so I didn't know to prep a second lie, have that ready. I didn't know there was going to be follow-up. So I was like, uh, YouTube? And they go, oh, the YouTube has offices in town? And I'm like, no, I work from my house. And they go, you can work from your house for YouTube? And I was like, well, I <laughs> I make my own video. I'm a, I do YouTube on my own. So that's the story. But the, what's missing, and it explains the fluorescent yellow shirt with the amazing logo, <laughs> is the next time I went and they... I got a coffee and they asked me, they go, oh, how are you doing today? I said, good. And they go, what are you doing? I go, I'm going to work. And they go, what do you do? And I go, I drive a dump truck. And then they go, oh, <laughs> that's it. And that's when I learned the magic of no one has a follow-up question if you are a dump truck driver. They just accept that as the answer and go, yeah, there's nothing I need to know. Like, um, I don't need to know how, how much dirt you haul or how much horsepower the engine is. No follow-up. I had to prep nothing for that. So... Jeff, the very funny viewer, decided we needed to officially make that story permanent with this extremely bright McKnight Trucking t-shirt. So there you go. So for those of you, the rest of the show, I this is the first time where the listeners will be so much happier than the viewers because the viewers are currently trying to adjust their monitors. <laughs> right now, there's probably about Half of you are trying to figure out where are the settings on my phone to adjust the colors. Okay. <laughs> uh, Jeff T says, Phil looks like he works at a water park. Ah, uh, yeah. See, uh, it's, a, it's a new look for me. It's, it's bright. It's bright for me to look at it. I'm looking at it too. But it's kind of fun. The next thing before we get started with questions and stuff. I know I'm, being, I'm taking liberties today. I just want to. I want to share some stuff with you that's pretty cool. And uh, I'm going to do it out of order. Not that it should be in any particular order. I had two good friends that I have in the industry send me two really cool gifts. And these are gifts that I'd like to share with you. Because they're, they're very unique. Um, now, the funny part, because there is a funny part, is I cannot share one of them with you. In fact... All I can share is a little, I'm going to try to put it in the camera, a little, there's a picture and there's a sticker. I just want you to see a little bit. And it says, don't share this. <laughs> it says, it says, hi, Phil, please don't share this. <laughs> That's what it says, this big piece of paper. Uh, it says, before the NAM show. Uh, so, uh, obviously you'll know who that is from. And when I show you this in a second, I was, uh, I got a beautiful gift from Larry DiMarzio of DiMarzio Pickups and it's of, he did the photo shoot of, you know what? You guys are worth it. Let's take it out of this piece of plastic here. I'm going to frame it. He sent me a picture. This is the photo that, oh, my camera, sorry, my mic. Here, let's do it that way so you can see it. He sent me, I'm sorry I'm so horrible at this, guys. There you go. Getting a little better. All right, there it is. He sent me a photo that he took. This is uh, of Steve Vai and the Dragon 3-neck guitar. Uh, Larry, of course, designed the pickups and some of the pickups on this guitar and uh, for DiMarzio. And, of course, he took the picture and with his, it's just a beautiful photo. Um, it's a huge. I, he explained everything to me, something about the new camera, 14 bajillion megapixels, something like that. I promise I was listening to the important bits, which is this is the photo he took, and he, and he signed it for me because he knew I was really into that guitar. We talked about the guitar on the show, and I was telling him how the guitar was the strangest thing I've ever seen. And, uh, and anyways, so he took this photo, and 
And he sent me a copy so I could frame it, which is a nice gift. What's nice, though, is there's another photo of not that guitar of something else. And he sent that to me. And he specifically, which made me laugh. That's why I want to share this part. He's, <laughs> there's a letter. If you can see, it's real fast. I want to keep it so you can't read it. It just says, don't show this. <laughs> <laughs> but I can, apparently, after whatever it is, is released to you guys publicly. So, uh, so there, uh, <laughs> there you go. That was cool. So the second thing I'm going to share with you, another gift, uh, is a gift that actually has a story, and this is why I want to tell it, because my buddy Joe, who owns Rat Pack Records, uh, sends me stuff from time to time. He's just like that. And, and uh, he sent me, he knows I'm a fan of Vixen, the band Vixen. And he sent me some Vixen stuff. This is the Vixen, like, giant postcard. It's signed by the drummer. And some Vixen playing cards. This is this is all the swag up stuff. And then he sent me their new Live Fire limited edition record. What? But check this out. There's the, the ladies. And it's in red vinyl. Look at that. Is that cool? Is that cool? So I got the new Vixen Live Fire record. And uh, by the way, Joe is, is a good friend. And he sends me cool stuff. Mostly he sends me records and other stuff. And he cost me a fortune because I had to buy a record player. And I say that sarcastically because it was worth every penny for his generosity. But why am I sharing that with you? Because I have to tell you my Vixen story because I want to tell it to, to Joe. And so it'll be permanently in this video. Um, when I, uh, everybody always asks me a thousand times, a million times, a bazillion times, what's your first guitar? What was your first guitar? I mean, I, you can find me on 50 different episodes of shows on this uh, podcast alone. Everybody's asked me every few months, what's your first guitar? My first guitar was a JB player Strat copy used and a um, CMC amplifier was my first guitar and amp. And uh, it was just Strat and it had what I remember is had big single coils. They didn't, they didn't look right, but it was just a black strat with a white pickguard. And it was an off-brand. Nobody knew what it was, And uh, but it was my first guitar. And I remember being so excited. <laughs> like I said, I was 15, to, uh, and I was so excited when I got the guitar. I got it on a Sunday. Uh, I got the guitar on a Sunday because um, the only store that was open on a Sunday in, in town was this one store, and that's what they had, and my parent, uh, parents could only go on a Sunday. So I got the guitar on a Sunday. On Monday, I couldn't wait to tell all my friends, okay? And I said, hey, got a guitar. I'm a guitar player now. It's the most exciting thing. Like, it was probably more exciting than learning to drive. It's just, I feel like I was going to, I thought I was going to school to make the announcement. I don't know if you've ever felt that way before in your life, where you walk in, you're like, I'm going to come in and announce this, and all the kids in the class will stare at you and go, yes, yes, you are a guitar player. Like, I, I kind of believe that to be true. So I, mostly it's my friends. So I tell my friends. And my friends immediately go, what kind of guitar did you get? And I said, oh, it's a JB player. And they go, I've never heard of that. And I go, yeah. And I go, it's cool. And they go, I don't think it's cool, man. They go, it's, um, you didn't get an Ibanez or a Fender or a Gibson or like, I'm like, no. Because <laughs> I'm like, I don't have that. My parents don't have that kind of money. So I was like, no. And uh, and then they kind of made fun of me. I got ridiculed. It was, uh, it was uh, you know, don't worry, I got over it. <laughs> but it was really like, oh, it sounds like you got a crappy guitar. And I was like, no, it's pretty cool, man. Like, I know nothing about guitar, but I'm like, it's so cool. It has strings and it's cool. And uh, and they were like, no, it's it's horrible. And um, <laughs> so they, then what happened was I became uh, not the butt of the jokes, but it was uh, always uh, a comment, you know, about my crappy guitar uh, because my friends had cooler guitars. They had uh, more actually looked cooler guitars, but they had name brand stuff. And so why this is funny was I can't remember if it was a month later. It could have been five months later. You know how time goes. Um, but I got a Guitar World magazine. And, and flipping through the ads, there was an ad with Vixen, and they were endorsing JB Player guitars. With, if you guys are crazy enough to go try to find those old ads, they were endorsing the JB Player guitar with built-in wireless. Had a guitar wireless built into the guitar. That was the thing. And uh, I saw the ad, <laughs> okay? And I was like, aha! And I like literally like, yeah, I don't know how to explain it, like a like I had like a lawyer with proof. I have the proof that my guitar is cool. Here is an ad. 
in Guitar World. I'm going to show my friends. So I take it to my friends and I show my friends. Look at this guitar in Guitar World. This is Jay Play. This is Vixen. Vixen is playing my guitar. And they go, those chicks suck. And I'm like, they are awesome. And this guitar is awesome. I was determined, right? And then this is what why the story is funny. Because it doesn't go the way I think it was supposed to go. See, I think it's supposed to go, I was supposed to be defeated, right? I had the crappy guitar, and then this band that wasn't like this A-list band. I don't want to consult them, because I, I insult them, because obviously I love them. But uh, you understand, when my friends were trying to degrade it, make it sound that way, like, they are not, you know, they're not whatever big rock band at the time. And I was like, they're on, uh, they're on MTV, man. <laughs> my friend's like, who cares? I'm like, you don't understand. They're on MTV and they're cool. And I like their albums and I have them. And this is, the, they play the same guitar as me and therefore it's cool. And believe it or not, it was a life-changing moment for me. And here's why. Because instead of like that thing that happens sometimes where like, and that's when I always had to have a brand name or that's why I always have to have something cool because I didn't, I'm the opposite now. I feel like I was cool and my friends were just too stupid to understand how freaking cool I was because I had this JV player and so did Vixen and that was cool. <laughs> I'm still convinced that's cool. In fact, even if the comment sections, you can get, you can have at it with me. I have not changed my mind in all these years. I am still cool. Vixen is still cool and JB player is still cool. <laughs> There you go. That's Joe. That's for you. That's my Vixen story. And that's why the album was really cool when you sent it to me. Because I was like, it brought back all those, like a, just a wave of those memories. And made me want a JB player again. But I can't find one. Not, the, not, like, not like the one I had. Shredder Life says, my first guitar was a Jay Terser. Yeah, it's, you know, it's funny. It's, it's, it's. <sighs> It's such a stupid thing to, 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 you know, right? Our first guitars, our, our second guitar, our guitars, you, you, we like what we like. Everybody here has different guitars. There's 800 people watching right now. 800 different guitars. Well, not really 800 different, but you get to understand there's a big di diverse amount of guitars out there. And, um, and um, you know, like I said, you got to like what you like. Um, Octopus Ears wants to know, do I have an acoustic? I do. I, I, I sometimes display them. Um, I have quite a few acoustics. Not a lot, uh, but all my acoustics are I use heavily. It's like my basses and my acoustics are the exact same situation. I play them the most, and I don't have very many of them because I, I specifically have them for a use. Uh, uh, mostly I'll play on my acoustics. I'll play my Taylor and my Martin. And then, of course, like I have a PRS acoustic that I like. It's a, a, a SE. And then I have a few other acoustics. Um, but mostly I play this one Taylor like a lot just because I like the way it feels. Um, I have a video of it, but it's a Sharp Max video when I put locking keys on it. <laughs> Kevin Smith wins. I don't know what you win, Kevin, but you win the coolest statement because he is right. He says that, Phil, you are living on the edge of a broken heart. You are right. <laughs> you are right. I am proud to say I am. You know what it was? I think that moment, why it was so big for me was, I think we spend so much time trying to convince somebody that you're cool. And I think at that moment, it wasn't that I decided I was cool. I think at that moment I decided, well, if they don't think I'm cool for this, then I guess it doesn't matter because there's nothing I could do about it. There was no way I was getting a different guitar. There's no way I was going to have to change anything. And, I, and like I said, it was really weird to me and still oddly strange to me that I still believe this, that it's kind of weird how you can feel vindicated <laughs> right? when you see somebody that you think is cool or better than you. Like that, to me, that's what it really was. The Vixen was a real band who was on MTV, who had real songs on the radio, who could play, and they had a JB player. So I was like, my math in my head, the gear math in my head, I guess at that time was, this can't be a bad guitar because how could they play music with it you know what i mean that was, and my friends are like it still sucks i'm like no it can't suck now that that doesn't make any sense right somebody made music with this i can make music with this and that's how i kind of feel and so there you go it's kind of why i feel like a lot of people uh like signature guitars now i think it's because obviously it's a great way to celebrate the the guitar players you love i think there's a little bit of that but also i kind of feel like especially if it's a guitar they actually use. I feel like when you're playing that guitar, you know you're not as good as them, but you feel like whatever's holding you back, it's got to be you because they're making all this great music with it. So 
I, that's kind of sometimes how I feel, right? Like if I pick up a a a, a Wolfgang or a, a Jim or you name your signature guitar, the the Silver Sky by John Mayer, the Silver Sky, and I'm playing it, and if it doesn't sound or isn't doing what it's supposed to do, I know it's not the guitar, it's me, <laughs> and I'm okay with that. That actually makes me feel good because I feel like I'm my only hurdle, and I'll just work on that. It's not like I have to like buy another guitar, or fix it, or do anything. I just kind of do that. So that's one of the. I think that's one of the. I don't know. I think that's one of the uh, uh, reassuring things of that. Thank you guys so much for letting me indulge you with some stories. And thank you guys for uh, taking the brunt of this yellow shirt because I know you guys are taking more of it than I am. Plus, like I said, this might be the only time you see me not in black. So take it in. Take it in. Yeah, Matt Harrison said, making music is the point. As long as you can do that, you're golden. I, I think that's what it was. I think that's what it is. Um, and sometimes that's why it's a, it's great to get uh, recentered. You know, obviously this is a gear channel. Because it's a gear channel, we talk about gear. It's not like we don't want to talk about music or playing. We do, but it's not really what this channel's about. There's so many other channels that are doing that other thing. You know, it's 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 my, my niche, so to speak. So I got to focus on that what I can help you guys with or, or educate ourselves about or talk about for fun. And But deep down, like I always tell you guys, none of this matters. Just the music matters. That's all that matters. It's that we get to make music, be around music, and uh, play music. Ivan is Prestige Boy says, Phil, bad boys wear black, McKnight. Yeah. I don't know, uh, I don't know where, why I wear black. I think uh, it's, uh, it's because... Um, and I'm, I'm serious. I mean this. Um, I used to not wear black at all. And then when we, when I opened the store and I as worked the store, slowly over time, that just becomes your default uniform for music stores. Black dicky shirt, black t-shirt, jeans. It's like this is the uniform of the guitar store employee. <laughs> and it just becomes this thing. And for me, um, t-shirts weren't really something I wore. I always wore dicky shirts because I was always, uh, I think I've told you guys this before. Uh, it's because when you work on guitars, you destroy your clothes. I mean, there's, that's, that's the thing. I would, I, I just go through so much, so many shirts, um, because the files, you know, cut, catch your, you know, shirt, or it's just all the, uh, the, the glues, the chemicals, a lot of the, um, a lot of the oils and stuff stain the clothes and you can't get them out and stuff. So it just, Dicky shirts are just like black dicky shirts, like a beautiful shirt for working on guitars. So it just became a literally that's um, that's how easy it became. Just that's what I want to wear. So I wore it all the time. And, and then for a while, I wore them in the videos. And then that, you know, I started wearing the Know Your Gear shirts. Mark says black is a slimming color. That's probably true. <laughs> I don't think it hurts the situation. Um, you know, just like vertical lines versus horizontal lines, all that stuff. But but I don't think anything, that's not my uh, psychology in it. It's just literally like, I just got used to wearing black shirts and blue jeans all the time and van shoes. <laughs> so there, it's uh, like I said, I'll probably change again. One day I'll go back. I used to not wear any black. Like I said, I used to wear only colors. It was kind of weird. Maybe it's, I don't know. Um, all right. Uh, Alan Sam's music wants to know, Phil, is that gold strap behind you a Shiji? It is. So if you guys know, I did some videos, videos for Shiji guitars. And, uh, one of them was a really more powerful video. If you guys know what I'm talking about, if you guys check that one out. And, uh, after all that correspondence with, uh, Shiji, I told him that all the guitars were very beautiful. Thank you for all the opportunities to make videos. However, I really, really, really want a gold hardtail strat. And, uh, so, um, there it is. I will do a video on it. It's uh, it's not a, uh, it was not sent to me specifically for review. This was sent to me specifically for me. This is my personal guitar. It's, uh, I sent him a list of what I wanted and he, I, I didn't, it's not custom. It's just specced out to where I want. I will share it with you guys. It will be a deep dive soon. <laughs> like I said, I'm just plowing through them as fast as I can get through them, as you guys know. Um, Flubity do. I just want to talk about this. Flubity do says he went from Vans to Skechers. I know, man, dude. I'm holding out. I still wear my Vans everywhere, and then the only time I don't wear Vans, I've gotten old enough now to where the only time I don't wear Vans is if somebody says like, "We're going somewhere," and I know we're going to be walking for like, you know, miles and miles. Like that day, I'm like, "Oh, 
we're switching to sneakers. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but I don't do uh, any of the padded inserts in my vans or any of that stuff. I just wear vans everywhere. Yeah, my feet hurt. Yeah, it hurts. It sucks. Uh, the older you get, the worse it gets. And um, But I just, I don't know what it is. I just have to wear vans. So, um, so there you go. All right. We, uh, we probably should get to, to work at this point. <laughs> 25 minutes in. And, uh, and uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, let's, uh, let's uh, do this. Uh, let me do a couple questions, then I want to talk about the recap of the week. Let's do the first question I got today, which was Adrian, who says, hey, Phil, what is the best type of strap locks? Uh, I'm not going to tell you what the best ones, because I don't know. Best is an impossible thing to say, because I'm not the judge of that. But I'll tell you which ones I prefer and why I prefer them. Um, I'm looking for something uh, solid, which I can uh, have confidence in. Sure, I understand that. So I used to be uh, a shawler guy. Um, the shawlers have changed the design. There's a lot, if you read the reviews, there's a lot of negative reviews on the new design and how people are concerned about it. I have not experienced that concerns, but I feel like it would be um, just not responsible of me to mention that because it is epically mentioned. Um, what I, because of that, I don't recommend shawlers anymore. So strap locks, let me just tell you what I use. I use Dunlop Duels, dual design strap locks. Dual design meaning it will take a regular strap, but, uh, strap or it will use the locking mechanism. I've told you guys before, I use the Daddario strap that has the lock on it, has a little plastic lock. I have a gray one and a black one. And that's why I also have dual design. So if you look at my guitars, some do have strap buttons. And if they do, that's what I'm using. I'm using the uh, Dunlop dual design, made in the USA, strap locks, trust them, love them. That's what I use. But most of my guitars, 90% of them, have the DiMarzio clip lock system on there. And I've said this before, I love it. I've never had a problem with it, but that's not why I use it. I use it because in 1992, like, I bought one. And then when I bought my second guitar years later, I was like, oh, <laughs> like, you know, I was like, how am I going to put a strap on, you know, one guitar? So I bought another uh, uh, DiMarzio strap lock. And then so that my straps are universal, um, because although you see they all have the ends for the strap lock, or most of them have the uh, DiMarzio strap ends, I have about one or two DiMarzio straps that I use for all the guitars. I mean, I have all the ones that I bought over the years, but I just use one or two. So I like DiMarzio strap locks. I like the Daddario straps that have the plastic lock in them. We've talked about them in before uh, that are very good. Um, in fact, you know what? You know, sometimes I get a little focused on how fast we can get through a question and maybe not on how well we can answer the question. And Daddario strap lock, I can share it with you. Uh, oh, in fact, check this out. This is actually cool. Uh, ho hold on, I don't know why it just kicked me out. Um, I'm gonna share something with you. Please, there it is, order history. Uh, because this is one of those instances uh, where, please be patient as I'm apparently got kicked out of my account, so I'm logging into it. Okay, um, so what I'm going to share with you, as I real quick, just to make sure there's like I have my credit card number on there. It's not. Okay, good. Uh, so you guys know this sometimes is what's better than me just me spouting off things is proof is in the pudding, so to speak, right? So here's an actual order I did on 4-6-2022. This is my order at Sweetwater. You see I paid $175. What I bought was that Diodario Auto Lock Guitar Strap in Skater Gray, but I have the black one. I had to buy some more Temple Audio plates for a video I was working on. And then here are, like I said, here I bought some dual design strap lock retainers. And these are the actual strap locks. But notice I only bought one. And then I bought five, see times five, five of the stra dual design strap lock buttons. That's why I like them. I buy the buttons, see, I, and I bought some cables for that pedal board I was working on. So I buy the buttons and then I buy like one strap lock. So that way, what's great is I can put this on a leather strap that I like, and then I can use this Daddario one to clip on any of these and use that on these. Uh, and, and then of course, I have my uh, DiMarzio ones. So that's what I actually use. So that's what I, tr so better than saying what's the best for me, because I don't know what's the best, but I can tell you what I use and what I trust, because I just bought that. I bought that stuff for my guitars. It's on my guitars and it's what I trust. That wasn't the first time buying that stuff. That was my, I just need some more. So there you go. There's proof in the pudding, as I would say, or they would say, uh, so we don't have to like, you're like, I don't know, does he really believe that stuff? And there you go, there's the proof. 
I, I put your money where your mouth is. That's what I bought. Um, Windsurf Maui says, do I even need a physical amp for practice or can I do it with a tablet and a computer? Absolutely, you can do it. You don't need an amp anymore. You absolutely don't need an amp. Um, no, you can use a, a multiprocessor and plug in use your headphones and run that into a powered speaker. You can run into, uh, run, uh, like, like you said, exactly. You can run a program like, uh, I rig or uh, guitar rig on your computer. I have those uh, softwares as well. Um, you can, you know, I mean, you can use anything now. It doesn't matter. Everything can, it can be made to sound really good. I use all kinds of different things for different situations. So yeah, Absolutely. So yeah, you don't need to. There's no real, not real right answer for anyone, but I can tell you this. There is an emotional answer that I, that I find for me. When I'm playing through, because it's not what, it's not the, it doesn't work the way it should work. See, the way it should work would, should be like, oh, when I'm recording or something or I'm working on music, um, I, I use the real amps. That's not how it works. When I record anything, for me, I'm using my Kemper or I'm using software because it's fast, it's easy, it sounds good, it's dummy proof because I'm not a studio engineer. Uh, like I said, I know guitars and I know pedals. I have a, uh, uh, you know, a, a library of information in my head for that stuff. But when it comes to like mic placements and all that stuff, I didn't spend years in the studio like some of the channels that do that, like Warren Hewart and stuff from Produce Like a Pro. Like, you know, I picked up tidbits from them and stuff. But other than that. Uh, I use that stuff. Uh, so that's what's funny. So, and then for practicing, like I said, on tra when traveling, I'll take my laptop with some software and an iRig interface and it's done. I don't need to worry about anything. So I find, I, I find for me, when I do use the amplifiers, other than YouTube videos, because I find that there's a value to you guys being reassured that there's an amp, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because otherwise... You know, I, I think a lot of people don't know how to relate to, hey, I run this pedal into an Axe Effects. I think there's a little bit of people are like, well, I don't have an Axe Effects, so how do I know what's going to sound? So I try to use an amp that you can identify with. Um, and, but personally, for me, the only reason I would use amplifiers and when I do use my amplifiers is for that exactly thing, for me. It's just because I want to have that moment. I want to feel the amp. I even want to sometimes hear how, how it doesn't sound perfect. I kind of like it. I was playing my Dr. Z the other night, and uh, I was attenuating it and doing all this stuff to it. And I remember enjoying it. And then at some point in the playing of it, I remember thinking, I bet you every single model on my Kemper or every single software or have or everything I have sounds better than this actual amp. But it's just so fun because it's, so not perfect it felt so real and organic and interacted so I, I loved it and i have a blast so i play my amps a lot but it's always for personal it's very very rarely do i need that for working stuff other than like i said for if i'm going to make a video for you guys uh susan says but my heart is stu stuck on the angle love the angle fireball 25 you know uh, it's pretty obvious, like I said, when I've said this before, I'll say it again. I think I, I feel pretty confident when I say this about YouTube channels. There's going to be exceptions, but I feel like most YouTube channels are like mine in, in the idea that, and I mean all channels. I don't mean like whatever subscribers. I mean, if you have 10 subscribers, I think everybody just, when you demo a piece of gear, when you're reviewing a piece of gear, you surround that piece of gear with stuff that, yeah, there's a, like I said, you guys know I like to surround stuff with people I think are things you can relate to and understand, but also things I like to play. So when you see stuff, I always tell people, if you really want to pay attention, I, it's what I do, okay? So I'm just getting, getting telling you what I do. When I watch a YouTube channel uh, and they're reviewing a pedal or an amp or a guitar or whatever, the thing I pay attention to the most is what else is in the video besides the thing that they're actually is the headline, right? So like, oh, they're reviewing the new, uh, you know, uh, JHS pedal, but out of the guitars they have, why did they use that guitar? Why did they use that amp? So it's it's because a lot of times it's their go-to. So it makes sense. So there you go. For instance, this week I reviewed the uh, Lawrence Petros 55, LPD 55 pedal. And if you noticed in that video, I used, uh, what did I use in that? I think I used the Les Paul and they use a Tele. And uh, the main reason is I... I like the way those two guitars played and I thought they would bring out the best of the pedal. And that was kind of the logic. Um, but notice I didn't bring out like the crazy Les Paul. The Les Paul, actually it's right there because it's on the wall because it's what we use. That's my Les Paul light. The Les Paul in that video is the, uh, 
Les Paul light. If you don't know what that means, I have a video on it. It just means it's a it's a Les Paul on a diet. <laughs> it's the it's the keto Les Pauls, if you will. So all right. Okay, hold on a second. All right, just looking at comments and stuff to see what is exciting. All right, go back to another question. Another question is, um, this one from Joe. Joe said, hey, Phil, any recommendations on the custom base builder from Kiesel? Um, the, it was an early uh, question, so I grabbed it, and uh, only because uh, I, yes, uh, any recommendations? Um, I can tell you this. It'll probably be another month or so, but it'll be during the summer. I'll have a video of a Kiesel base. I, I ordered a Kiesel base. So um, I did it a while back. So, and um, and uh, what I decided to do for that video is, uh, and that, part of that, so you know, was John's fault. You know, the viewer that sent me his his Kiesel. It got me all like, ah, oh, I need, <laughs> maybe I need a guitar. And I go, I don't, I don't know if I can do a $4,000 Kiesel. I was like, I don't know if I'm in the market for that. That's crazy. Uh, God bless him, but uh, I was like, oh. And so I go, you know what? I was thinking about this, and I go, there's a bass that I've been really, really thinking about. So the reason, Joe, I point that out is because in that video, I decided to film me using the uh, bass builder. So it, it's, it's, in fact, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not even sure it's even a review video. It's kind of more of like a, like a documentary of how it all happened, you know, what I ordered, how long it took, you know, what it's like when it got here. And so on. Uh, Brian says, I recently purchased a PRS S2 McCarty 594 from Sweetwater. I ordered it over the phone and with my sales engineer, and he said that affiliate credit is online only using links. Is that right? That is 100% correct. That is absolutely true. So what Brian is asking, thank you, Brian, because I'm sure what happened was you were trying to see if I got credit for something. So as you guys know, if you use some of the links in the videos down below of the channels that work with companies like, uh, you know, Toman or uh, Reverb and uh, Sweetwater and Sam Ash, there's all kinds of affiliate links out there. And, um, and uh, if you click on those links, there's percentages given to the channels of what you purchase for a period of time on all kinds of purchases, not just the, not just the item they're talking about. And this is why I tell you guys all the time, and I've said this before, to call in, if you're especially with Sweetwater, if you're calling, if you're going to buy something Sweetwater, call Sweetwater and get a deal. Ask them for a deal. Ask them to do something for you. If you do that, I get absolutely no credit whatsoever. And I've said this before, and I will say it again. Trust me, they don't pay me that much. It's not that I don't appreciate it. I do, because it's just extra revenue for what I do. However, I would rather you get 10% off and put that in your pocket than me get, you know, 4% or whatever it is they're giving me now on a purchase. What I've learned is, and this is why I tell you guys this all the time, what I've learned just with the affiliate thing is, uh, you know, this channel receives a million, million and a half views a month consistently for the last few years. Like I said, we're on our road to 100 million views. And um, just through the, you know, just through the, the randomness, Things get clicked and you buy something like you. I see it all the time. You guys buy strings and picks and I get a little piece of that because you guys, you know, buying stuff. So, you know, there's sometimes there's no reason to call up. Don't call, you know, don't. I'm not saying don't, but, you know, you don't call up Sweetwater and go, hey, I'm going to buy a strap for $8.99. What's the deal, man? You got a deal? <laughs> Maybe you do. If you do, let me know. Maybe I'm doing this wrong. I, I've told you guys before. I always ask for a deal from Sweetwater if I buy in bulk. I always do that. I do that to Musician's Friend, too. They, Musician's Friend does a better deal than Sweetwater, but Sweetwater will get it out faster, and uh, and that sometimes appeals to me, that it's out a little faster. Um, but uh, but that's uh, what I was basically saying is to, to Joe's question. Was it Joe? I'm sorry. It was uh, to Brian. To Brian's question, uh, I don't get a piece of that, so to speak, but that's perfectly fine, like I said. I'd rather you get a deal. Put that money in your pocket. Uh, I, you know, hey, it's your money. You work for it. You keep it. <laughs> like I said. All right. Uh, okay. Um, 
All right, there's so many, so many things. All right, let's go to the next one. What's the next one? Kowal, Kowal Guitar Life says, he's a member of the channel, he says, can, no, could, could I? Could I? I don't know. Could I get a shout out? Could I give a shout out? I'm going to rephrase your question a little bit or statement. He wants to know, can I give a shout out of his YouTube channel? Uh, he could use the help. Kowal Guitar Life, I have not seen your channel, so I can't like recommend it to people. Like, hey, check out his channel. Sometimes I'll say that like on Brian's Guitars channel or something. But I will tell you this, Kowal. I will check out your channel this week. Weekend. I promise you. I will watch it. I will. When I index this, I will make sure that I watch it sometime in the weekend. I'll watch a few of your videos. I'll make sure I'll comment so you know I did that. And if you, if you want to check it out, uh, you can check it out too. It's called Koal Guitar Life. I'll put a link when I when I do this indexing on the on the uh, when this video repeats. And uh, and uh, and uh, so there you go. We'll learn we'll learn how good his channel is together. But yeah. By the way, it's a very good idea, uh, Koal. <laughs> right? I always tell people, you know, that's how you get found. Somebody recommends you. It it helps. Every little bit helps, man. It's a it's a jungle out there. So, all right. Um, and then slow Indio, in I don't know, Indio. Slow Indio says, I wonder if Phil does the show without air conditioning. Are you kidding? <laughs> no. Uh, this is across the high peak times. Uh, or he splurges on the AC. I splurge on the AC, man. Where I live, I don't know where you are, but where, where, where we live in Arizona, uh, no, you have AC. There's just no... There's no way around it. Today's 107, and <laughs> so it's 107 degrees. It's probably 107 right now. Uh, you know what? Let's find out. So I don't, somebody's going to correct me. I know it. Okay, ready? What is the weather right now? It is currently, right now as I'm speaking, 105 degrees. So it's 105 degrees outside. So yes, the AC's on. Uh, and so the AC's always on. <laughs> Not really, but it's, it's, uh, but think about this. We have no cooling bills. Like, uh, so when you guys are all paying money in the wintertime, uh, I think, I think my wife said my, the winter bills are like $30 or $23 a month, something not for the electricity, but for, I think gas is how we heat the house or something. It's really cheap. So yeah. Uh, LPD pedal says <laughs> LPD who also lives where I live says the AC never stops. Yeah. This is just look. I, I tell my children this all the time, so you guys know. Um, where I live in it, in Phoenix, Arizona, it's basically, uh, what do you call it? It's a uh, terraformed. No one's supposed to live here. This is an uninhabitable place. <laughs> everything that's here, the only reason people live where I live, I mean, is because everything was brought here <laughs> against its will. The water that's here was brought here against its will. Everything was brought here, and we terraformed this place into something livable that looks kind of like California now, but it's uh, 117 in the height of the summer and 105, obviously, in May. So, yeah, AC bills are just things you have to accept. <laughs> uh, so there, there you go. There, there you go. Um, all right. Um, all right, let's, let's go to the next question. Since, um, we have, we have Antique Rocker says, I love my PRS hollow body too with Piezo system. Piazzo. Uh, I know, Piazzo. Uh, it says, um, now I'm looking for semi hollow body 12 string with Piazzo. Uh, I think I'm hunting for a unicorn. Any suggestions? You are. I don't know of a of a of a twelve string electric guitar with a transducer. I will look. You know what? I think I don't even think I remember one over the years like coming across one. It's not something I. Th it's a great idea though, if you think about it. Um, not in a semi hollow. Maybe electric guitar twelve string. I don't know. But now I'm curious because you know that's actually probably the ultimate twelve string to have is something that does that because then you can get that acoustic 12-string sound. And um, one of the things I don't like about 12-string acoustics is, I mean, it's just a brutal thing to do to a neck on <laughs> acoustic guitars. Like I said, a lot of times you have to keep them half-step tuned down. Uh, and I say that because I've repaired so many of them over the years. People just bring them in, and 
just so much string tension for all the time on that neck. It's just, it's like I said, it's brutal. Um, the best forever for acoustics were guilds. Guilds made the best 12 strings. That's why I almost think about this. Like that's why you saw players who always played Martins and Taylors. Um, you know, like Tom Petty, same thing. I think, you know, uh, they would play Martins and Taylors or they play Gibson's acoustics. And then they'd always have a guild 12 string. And it's because they sounded great, but also those necks were a much, much better for a 12 string guild, put the time to make the necks stronger. Um, but yeah, I think an electric 12 string would be great. But yes, with the um, Piazzo system. Uh, Derek says, hey, Phil, love the show. Listen uh, every week, but love catching it live. Hey, thank you. It says, uh, listen to past episodes while running scales for hours. That's smart. I always say that. You can listen to me jabber away in the background while you just play. You just play, play your scales, play your chords, practice while you're doing this. I mean, we're going to be talking for an hour to two hours, so why not? Uh, it says your library content content is enormous Contri- contribution to the community. Thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate the that was very very kind of you. It's always nice. Uh, you know what's funny is I always uh, think sometimes when you guys hear me and I'm like oh it's very kind of you and stuff I always kind of feel like uh, it's like I'm trying to be humble. What it is is for every comment like that I have fifty like go suck it. <laughs> you can't be on a on a social media platform and not be told off daily. Uh, are called horrible things daily. Um, and uh, and uh, so why why it's important is when I hear that stuff, it feels so different than what I'm used to. Even most <laughs> even most compliments on social media, when you read them, they're really not very complimentary. <laughs> what do they call them? The backhanded compliments? Like you read the comment, you're like, hmm, I don't, think that's nice (laughs) but so like i said so it's not that i'm trying to come across humble i just literally when i hear a compliment it's uh it's a little shocking to to the system you're so used to you're almost prepared daily for okay what is someone going to talk about today (laughs) it's going to be it's going to not it's going to suck okay so but so derek thank you man it's a it's a it's kind uh Corey says uh looking for a small low watt tube amp considering the supro delta king eight inch speaker a one watt eight inch speaker uh and he says any experience with that amp or other small low watt uh tube amps sure I, you know what it is i really like the supro stuff um and i've i've reviewed a few of them and i owned a couple of them and i don't know why i don't have one anymore i think at one point i just kind of came across the idea that they're too much like my fender amps and i was kind of just always playing the fender amps it's funny that i was and and supro what they did that was strange for me was which is good for me. It was very good for me was, you know, I bought a couple of amps over the years and I like them and then I got rid of them. And then I go, Oh, that was a bad move. I should buy them again. They don't make them anymore. And then when you find them used, everybody was asking more than I sold from mine for. And I was like, well, then I'm not doing that. Um, but no, I recommend that amp. I think Supro makes good stuff. Um, for low wattage tube amps, if you're looking at Supro, I mean, there's tons of stuff. Vox makes great stuff. Uh, Fender makes great stuff in the low wattage area. Um, there's a lot of uh, great amps. That's the downfall of those kind of questions is it's like, Hey, what's a good amp? It's like, actually what's harder is what amp should you stay away from? And there's not a whole lot. The only amp I really don't love that's a one watt amp is I don't like the DSL Marshall one watt head that came out. Um, because I, like I said, they, the original, uh, limited edition version had a gain control in the clean. And it's not that I wanted the clean to be, to be dirty, distorted, that gain control gave that amp fullness on the clean channel. And so I didn't like the clean channel. That was probably the first amp I ever said, okay, I'm not digging this. Uh, but I absolutely like the, the, all the models of, of the DSL above that one. And I don't hate the one watt. That's not the takeaway from that. I just wasn't, I wasn't a fan. Uh, <laughs> Vim 69 says, awesome. We take big dumps. Yeah. Look, we take big dumps. <laughs> Just so you know, um, <laughs> what's funny was this shirt came on a Saturday, or at least I, you know, it was handed to me on a Saturday, I think by my son. And I think we had friends over. I'm pretty sure we did. And, uh, and I think one of my friends was like, what's that? And I go, I don't know. It's a shirt, I think. Cause it's, you know, shirts got to always look like they're in a bag and open it up. It was just beaming. Right. It was like, it was like this. Look, okay. Ready? This is for special effects. It was like, whoa. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, whoa, what is this? And I pulled out a shirt and I thought, and the first thing I thought, and this is Jeff, the one said to me, so you know this. The first thing I thought is, I am never wearing that ever. Like literally I didn't say it out loud, but that's the first thing I thought, like, 
boy, it's kind of people to send me something, but that's never going on my body. And then I pulled it out, saw the logos, laughed my ass off, and then my friends laughed their ass off, and then we were like, I got to wear that. <laughs> so there you go. All right. Dan says, my dream guitar is a white Gibson Les Paul Custom. That's a beautiful guitar and a great dream guitar to want to have. Uh, if I never sold it, if I never sold it and I put fake on it, do you think it would be okay to buy a Chipson? Look, uh, if you watch uh, China Guitar Skeptic and uh, his channel, he's I've learned a lot. I'm not, I was never a really big fan of the uh, AliExpress fakey guitars, okay? I've seen too much. As, you know, Remember, I had this retail world experience for many years before I came to YouTube. And so in the retail world experience, you get to see a lot of the carnage of those things because they end up in the worst hands and they do the worst things with them. Okay, so that's what irritates me about that stuff. However, however, uh, um, what I've learned from channels like China Guitar Skeptic and uh, and uh, Steve from Boston and things like that is that you can order those guitars and then just put a fake name like you can put Chipson on it. You can put Chipson on it. You just request it when you order that guitar. So what do I think of that? I think that's hilarious. I think it's awesome. I think that's exactly what it should be. Look, it's kind of like my JB player story. This ties totally into that earlier, okay? To me, I have no issue at all, ethically, at all, with anyone ordering a Strat, Tele, Les Paul, SG, Gretsch, I don't care, a Gretsch style guitar, I mean, not the Gretsch, uh, any guitar from anyone, whether you have it built by a custom high-end luthier or you have it mass produced somewhere or you have it, you know, cheap guitar made somewhere and it doesn't have their trademarked information on it. Again, the designs are the designs. Everyone is going to argue where that is. In most cases, the designs aren't even protected, but when they are, look, it's not about, it's not about, uh, you know, it, well, at that point, if you're let's back up, at that point, if you're putting chips in on it, or you put your name, you could put Dan's Les Paul, or you get a, get original with it. You could do something crazy, right? You can. It's your last name is Brown, and so we can call it Brownson, <laughs> right? Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. In fact, I think the chips and idea is actually hilarious. I think there's actually some cachet to that. I think if somebody walked up to me and said, oh, you want to see my, you know, $5,000 Gibson? And I go, sure. And they pull it out and they go, look, and it's a Chipson on it. And it's a Chipson on it. It looks like that. I'd be like, I'm be like laughing. I'm like, that's great. Because again, it's the intent that of why it exists makes sense to me. It's to be like this guitar you like. It's more affordable. You can put some time and money into it. You can make that guitar great. I've played a lot of the fake uh, guitars that are like that. The issue is never, to me, the design and stuff. The issue is always the putting the Gibson logo on it or putting the, the Gretsch logo. I've heard arguments from even friends who are like, I don't think it matters. I don't plan to sell it. You know, and, and I, you know, but what I've said is it's not even the legal aspect of it. That's not my argument. My argument is that a lot of them do end up sold and they do end up conning people. And so that's the thing that you hate seeing. And... I love it because a lot of people, more than I think there should be, always will take the thing of like, well, you know, people need to pay attention or, you know, it's kind of like when people get conned or taken advantage of people go, well, they need, they, need, they need to wise up. And I was like, yeah, well, you're only wise because you got screwed. That's why you're wise. Like when somebody goes, I would never fall for that. And I'm like, only because you already fell for it. You see, just because, you know, wouldn't it be great if you didn't have to get screwed to get smart enough not to get screwed? <laughs> So there is an argument to both sides. Like I said, I don't fall for pretty much any scams anymore, but that's because I've been hosed like most people a different way, a thousand different ways. So yeah, I like that kind of stuff. I don't think that's wrong. And I think those companies prefer it. I don't think they, I, I know it's weird, but I, that's the sense I get. I think they rather just, look, they just want to play your, you know, they just want to make you a guitar so they can make money. And they really rather not, <laughs> you know, uh, violate laws to do it. Yeah, Matt says you may not intend to sell it, but it gets stolen. Look, it's not even that. And that's a great point, Matt, by the way. But also, eh, you know, y why put yourself into that position that, you know, what if I, you know, you know, I'll never sell it. Well, now you can't sell it. 
you know. So that's what I would do. I would I would do it. I would do it cool like that. I would come up put in put it exactly like want. And what's cool about that is it'll always have a cool story. Like I always wanted this guitar, so I had one made, and the only thing I changed was this. And and if you want a suggestion, Dan, I think on the guitar it should be called the uh, McKnight <laughs> trucking it <laughs> the big dumps. I'm just kidding, man. I'm sorry. I'm dipping in there too hard. It's breaking the rule of three in comedy, right? Can't make the joke more than three times. Joshua says, hey, Phil, I just bought a secondhand Milkman Creamer, and the reverb has a hum that gets louder as I cranked up the reverb knob. Any suggestions? Well, reverb tanks are the most problematic, and uh, there could be a couple things. First of all, you understand that probably, and I don't know the anatomy of that amp. I'm not versed in it, but most amps, especially boutique type amps like that are going to have a tube preamp uh, tube, preamp tube uh, attached to the reverb, right? It's going to be tube driven. So there's probably like a 12AT7 in there or a 12AU7, probably more likely a 12AU7. Again, I'm not a amp guy per se. I just know enough to be dangerous sometimes. Um, but in these cases, I can give you at least a little insight. So you could be getting that problem through the tube. Tube is always the first thing you should check. It's pretty easy. Hopefully you have a, a preamp tube to swap out with that one. Doesn't matter even if it's 12X7 because you're just trying to solve the problem. Turn the amp off, you know, and then pull the preamp tube once it's not hot because you don't want to burn yourself. Uh, put the new tube in there and uh, then turn on the amp and go through the paces and see if that solved the, uh, the issue, uh, the noise issue. And um, if it did, then you know you need to get a new tube, preamp tube. If you don't have a preamp tube, there's an old trick that we used to use when we were poor, which is swap tubes. You just take two preamp tubes, swap them. Just make sure you know where they came from because sometimes there are labeled different preamp tubes, 12A7s, 12AX7s, 12AX7s. 12 AU7s, 12AT7s, AT7s, so you just want to make sure they're fine. Um, swap the tube, make sure that's fine. If it's not the tube, it's probably the tank. The tanks get problematic all the time, and I don't know how to fix a reverb tank. I have some friends, not amp guys, but just friends who are like just determined not to pay the $30, $40 for a new reverb tank, and they've jacked with them until they fixed them. Me, anytime a reverb tank acts up, I just buy a new one. They're, even in today's market, they're relatively inexpensive for comparable for what that amp costs. Just getting a new Accutronics uh, tank. Tanks are, they just go out, man. Those are just tubes and reverb tanks are just, that's just things that go bad. If it's not those things, then yeah, you're going to probably have to figure out what it is. And it's probably, it could be a design problem. And it could be, you know, electricity. It could be all kinds of things. But, the, but let's just do the easy things. Like I suggest, those things are easy to do and check. If, just so you know, if you have another amp with a reverb tank, you can then pull that reverb tank or even use the cables and connect it to a re another reverb tank and check it that way too, by the way. There's another way to do it. Okay, 94 Dodge Dude says, hey, I had around, I had around 15 mid-range guitars. Now I have a parts caster, a core McCarty 594, a USA HP special Floyd Rose. That's the uh, PV HP. It's like the... It's like the Wolf King. Um, now I'm going to spend 10K, okay, for a true custom luthier built guitar, acoustic. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, more important than a guitar, acoustic guitar. Am I crazy to just spend everything on four axes? No. It's, um, I've said this before. There's this argument of what's right for you is right for everyone concept. It's really, it spills over into everything, of course. And, that's the reality. Like, I get it sometimes. I get, you know, like I said, people like make comments. They'll go, oh, why don't you sell all those guitars and just get one nice guitar? I'm like, okay. Why don't I sell all these guitars and get one cheap guitar? Because you can get a nice cheap guitar, too. I don't have to buy an expensive guitar. If I if the whole point was to have one guitar, I don't have to have an expensive guitar to be that one guitar. In fact, I would gladly just pick a Strat and just say, okay, oh, that's my one guitar. Um, it's because there's a lot of things that you're getting out of this. So, no, I think, um, I think players do that. They plume up the collection. I think, you know, a lot of us have been talking about this recently. We feel um, that there's a wave of used guitars coming, and there's different arguments for that. There's a lot of people believe that there are a wave of cheap guitars coming. I was just talking about this this week with, uh, uh, with a friend, and they were saying, hey, there's a wave of cheap guitars coming because all these people learn guitar in pandemic, and now they're going back outside, and now there's going to be flooded with cheap guitars. And I don't believe that at all. <laughs> so, you know, if it happens, it's going to be very minute. Um, what I believe is 
what we saw was is yeah we saw an influx of people starting to play guitar okay and if they bought cheap guitars a lot of people even in the economy they're they're if they're not versed in guitar they bought themselves a uh a donner or some kind of inexpensive guitar they're probably just gonna let it rot in the closet that's what people do with those guitars they really don't see the light of day because they're not worth anything you know, they paid $150 for a guitar, and even with the market, they're not going to go and get $100 for it. They're going to get $50 for it. It just becomes a nuisance, and it just lays around. And they give it away to a kid or whatever. So what I think you're going to see is right now is that during the pandemic, collectors, guitar players, because guitar players almost by nature are collectors, especially the ones that say they're not. I find the most, they're hip, most hypocritical are the ones that buy the most. But... Uh, <laughs> Right, that's why they're hypocritical. They're ones that shun it the most, seem to buy the most. But anyways, um, guitar players buy all these guitars because, of course, they're they got stimulus money, they got extra gas money because they're not spending on gas, they and they uh, they're depressed as hell. And God bless them because probably every guitar that you bought was one less alcoholic beverage consumed or something else because you got to deal with whatever you're dealing with somehow, right? I mean, not everybody's lucky enough to go for a jog and feel better. So, uh, although God bless those people. So here's the thing about that. What I see as someone who's been around this for his whole life and is just immersed in it daily, every day, my day waking up, day closes, all guitars, all guitars. As you can see from the earlier part of the show, I'm just all I do is talk to people who are in the guitar industry. We just talk guitars. What I see is everyone I know at some point at this point is got a record number of guitars. Their collections have gone, they're all bloated. My collection's a little bloated and I try to thin down as much as I can on the guitars, but it's bloated. Everyone I talk to, I think that if I ask, ask them honestly, I'm asking you guys honestly, if your guitar collections feel a little bloated right now, the majority of you are going to say yes. The only exception is going to be somebody like that says, oh, no, not me, because I just got rid of some, right? Maybe that's the exception. So I think what's going to happen is besides a economical downturn and all the other things that could create all the markets to go crazy, I think we're just going to have to deal with the fact that at some point you're going to go, do I need 35 guitars? Do I need 12? Do I need two? And then you're going to see it thin down. So... Um, and there's going to be all kinds of reasoning for that. And to bring it back to 94 Dodge Dude, I don't think what you're doing is actually unique. I think you're actually doing what I think a lot of guitar players are going to do. Because like I said, there's this logic that says the economy will slow down and all this stuff will happen. Again, that's probably all true. Um, however, and that's what's going to cause all the guitar sales. But I'm talking about, we're talking about people who are like, like him, like 94 Dodge Dude. He's like, I don't need... 30 guitars. I think I'm just going to get one really nice acoustic and a couple of nice guitars. And that's going to be good for me. And that's where I think we're going to see the influx of sales on guitars. They're going to get crazy. And that brings up a crazy thing. That's uh, that some, I got two emails this week. Let me share them with you. Uh, hold on a second. Okay. Hold on a second, please be patient. So I got a couple emails this week um, and uh, from friends, and it was like all like a panic. Uh, not really a panic. I shouldn't say it. Two of them were like, ah, oh, this is weird, and one was like panicked. They got a notification from Reverb saying that Reverb's starting a new program. This is why this is interesting, called Trade-In for Cash. So Trade-In for Cash uh, is is a program that's going to start in June – in re on reverb and what it is is it looks like you go to sell something and then they just give you an offer for it up front and i think what they're doing is is they have their uh, 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 soliciting stores so because so for instance like maybe chicago music exchange or you know uh you know uh, you know, you know, LA music, those stores will elect for this. So what happens is let's say in theory, let's say you're going to sell your, uh, your PRS S2 Vela and you're like, okay, cause I bought two for some reason. <laughs> right. And you're like, okay, I'm gonna sell one. And the market price is a thousand dollars in theory. They're going to immediately, before you even sell, go, this person will give you $500. It's going to be just like taking yourself to guitar center. It's, Reverb is basically going to go, you know, we'll give you nothing for it. In fact, they gave examples. Here are some of the examples. One of the examples that I thought was hilarious was a SM57 microphone. So it was saying like, so in this program, let's, let's say you want to sell your SM57 microphone. 
it says the SM57 microphone goes for $66 to $92. But if you push the cash button right now, you can get $36 right now from one of the buyers. And uh, I, 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 here's my problem with this. I'm sharing this because when I first got this, I thought, oh, yeah, you know, that makes sense. But then it started hitting me. This might be like a predatory kind of thing. Like, wow, they know that they know because, you know, people know their business. Reverb had a record quarter first quarter of this year. I don't know if you guys know that. It was record sales. Reverb had record sales first quarter this year. And so Reverb probably uniquely knows the used market better than probably any other guitar entity because of all the data they collect. And so they probably know this program probably, especially during summer, because summer is when people are not going to be spending a lot of money on other things like gas, because gas prices are going to go up. And so it's almost like they want to get in and, and in the ground floor of buying all our stuff dirt cheap. And that's why I'm sharing this with you, because the podcast is about talking about guitar, but it's also a communal thing, right? I want the community to be aware of things, like when we talked about their the reverb, the scams on reverb and all that stuff. It's about talking about this. I want you to be aware of this. Um, it's crazy. So, you know, I think this is a crazy idea, because um, like I said, it feels predatory in the timing of it. Because they, I think they know that there's going to be what I'm predicting, and a lot of people like me are predicting that there's going to be a huge amount of influx of used gear as people go, you know, I think I don't need six amps or 25 pedals or 10 guitars. And they, they and then they're just like, hey, let's see who will sell dirt cheap for the convenience of it. So if you do that, it's on you to do that or not do that. I don't tell you what to do. Um, but I will tell you that... Just be aware that that's the, what's coming. And that's another reason why I think it's coming. The tidal wave of used gear is coming because, uh, because of that. Why what else would they do it right now? What a weird time to release a program where it's like, yeah, we'll buy your stuff extra cheap. <laughs> I'm, I remember I laugh at awkwardness. I'm not laughing about it. Just like that when I hear that, I go, it just gets pawn shop prices. Tampa Blue says pawn shop prices. Absolutely. Well, so, you know, looking at it, it even look worse than what Guitar Center would uh, offer you. Uh, and that's what I was going to tell you. Something to think about is, you know, I'm not a huge fan of Guitar Center, but look, I'm always I'm always upfront about what my biases are with, with who they are, with, you know, with who they are with. And Guitar Center sounds to me like if you go to Guitar Center to, tra you know, to do that, sell Guitar Center stuff. If you do a trade with Guitar Center, they'll give you 60%, I think, of what it sells for. But more importantly, they'll give you 10% off something if you buy it used. Somebody might say that's wrong now because th their programs change all the time. But I'm just, like I said, just be educated out there. And uh, and I'm, Guitar Center is not a great deal, but it sounds like it's already a better deal than what Reverb's got cooking up. So just interesting, interesting stuff. So all of that from that one question, which is Dodge, uh, Do 94 Dodge Dude. So to into the into the question, sorry, buddy, is that, um, yeah, you should buy the acoustic because remember the rule here is if you ask if you should buy a guitar, the, the answer is yes. Let's help the economy and help luthiers. And two, um, you know, uh, you know, if you got the money, just do it. It's kind of like, that's what my friends say to me when I'm like, always like you, I'm like, should I do that? Should I spend this? They're like, dude, if you got the money, spend it. If you don't, don't. That's as simple as that is. Um, but what I will tell you, 94 Dodge dude, is don't also, don't be afraid of your lifespan as a musician. If at one point you have a lot of guitars and then you have a little guitars, there's nothing wrong with that. Like I said, uh, you know, do what makes you happy at the moment. Try to make the best financial decisions you can with those decisions. But also keep in mind that joy, there's a price that you have to pay for joy, you know, to some degree. I don't know if that's good advice, but that's at least what I'm recommending. Grumpy Mike Guitar, he says, for the, I'm going to read it this time, for the tone jar, and why not? He says, I don't know why, but I, I, need, a, I need to have a McKnight trucking shirt in my life. I, um, I, was, at, I was thinking about asking Jeff if he was wanted to sell some of these shirts to you guys, if any of you would crazy enough to want one. Um, I will reach out to Jeff if he's not watching this episode right now. I will reach out to him and see if he's interested in doing that. Uh, I don't know how he does that, but that's that's how that would work. It's his idea. Obviously, it's his idea for a shirt and stuff. So I don't think too many of you would be crazy enough to have them, but I think they kind of are funny. So <laughs> so I'll, I'll find out. <laughs> I'll find out. Uh, Pedal Lee says, uh, for the pedal jar, I liked the rock angle you took on the 55 pedal. Yeah, you know, I appreciate that. When I did that video, what's funny about that is, um, is 
I've changed the way I've done videos over the last year or two to actually definitely say two years. And one of the things now, and definitely the patrons see this to some degree, there's like a version of the video and then it's not like before where like I take some stuff out or maybe add things. Like all of a sudden it reformats because I'm actually like almost like creating different storylines. So I'll, I'll record a few things and then I decide like, how, you know, what does the video need to convey? And that was a, definitely an example of that. Um, that's why in that video I was like, okay, I'm going to hit it. And then I was doing the blues stuff and I was thinking, you know, I think I'm pretty sure that'll get covered out there. I'm sure that's what they'll talk about. So let's talk about the rock stuff. And that's basically what I was trying to, I try to do is, is, um, anytime I think, uh, there's going to be multiple videos on the same product in a short period of time. The first thing I think about is how uh, same thing with, I did the same thing. So, you know, with the, uh, the, um, uh, Yamaha Revstar guitar, um, everyone released their Revstar guitar and I was like, okay, everybody's going to talk about this guitar. What can I talk about that no one will talk about? And the reason I do that is just for my own sanity of making the video. <laughs> Sometimes when you're making a video and you're talking to the camera, you can just picture like everybody going, hi guys, today I'm going to show you this guitar and it's really cool. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not making fun of them. I'm making fun of me. That's how I do videos too. But I was like, and then you're in your head going, what is unique? You know what I mean? Why does, why do we have to have 20, 20 of the same takes? And you actually, you know, what gave me this idea was, um, at some point in, during the pandemic, I watched TikTok and, um, it, it was one of my friends that recommended TikTok to me. He's like, oh man, TikTok's hilarious. You got to go to TikTok. So I signed up for TikTok and I watched TikTok and I have to say this is the weirdest experience I probably ever had with anything in my life where I was watching TikTok and I was like, this is amazing. It's hilarious. I was like finding crazy things and watching things. And it took no time, like 24 to 48 hours. And by the second, third day of looking at stuff, it just started feeding me the same thing, just different people doing the same thing. And then I, I would talk to my daughter and talk to friends and I go this, and they go, yeah, that's what TikTok is. And I go, what? So it's like, this is a funny song. And then now you just watch 80 people lip sync to that same song. And now this is a funny thing. And so everybody just does the same video. So now you watch 80 of the same video, but 80 different people doing it. And they're like, yeah. And I go, I am bored to tears. I just cannot do this. And I, so I, you know, I got rid of my TikTok and I couldn't take it anymore. Of course, now they feed TikTok to you through YouTube and Instagram. So there's no escaping that. But, but the point is, that's what I, gave me the idea. I'm like, yeah, so why, why don't I do that when I do a video where I know there's going to be a lot of videos uh, the same time frame? Why don't I focus on anything that I think they might miss or not do? Not because I want anything else other than what if somebody watches all the videos, at least they'll be all the videos will be different. So that's kind of the thing. So the reason I say all that is thank you, um, Pedal Lee for noticing that or making that comment, because, uh, it's, it's funny that that comment's more powerful than like a view or a thumb up, because that tells me that you noticed it. If you noticed it, that means I'm doing something right. Even if only you noticed it, if no one else notices, it, I don't care. One person goes, that video was slightly different. And that was an interesting take on that. Thank you. That's all I cared about. Even if that means sometimes doing that, I don't think I'll get as many views as somebody else sometimes because, you know, now I don't have the same angle as them, but there you go. But thank you. Jameson Snow says, Hey, Phil, new guitar day. Got my Schecter Nick Johnson in pink finally. And I love it. I'm announcing it. It's <laughs> just like you did on the cool kids at school. You know, the Nick Johnson Strat, I got to play one of those. I played the Surf Green one, and it is a fantastic guitar. And they make an orange one too, right? Am I wrong? Or is that the pink one I'm thinking of? Very, very cool guitars. That was definitely one of those guitars, like, I was like, uh, I was considering getting, and then at some point I didn't do. So it's funny, it's, I don't know why it fell off my radar, but Roasted Neck, it, it just, I, I love that guitar. So congratulations on your new guitar. And yes, you should be super proud. It's a great guitar. Voodoo Fist says, happy Memorial Day weekend. $10 for the KYG tip, tip jar. I appreciate that. This is Memorial Day weekend, uh, and uh, and uh, we have family in town, so we'll be doing stuff, family stuff. So, hey, that's good, right? Uh, Thomas uh, sent me a, uh, a super sticker. So uh, if you guys don't know, it's a it's a bird. I think it's, I think it's a fat bird. It looks like a fat bird. It could be a fat bear. I don't know what it is, but it's cool. 
Thank you. Uh, non-existent human says, is there a reason why Ovation and their high-end brand Adamus don't hold value in the used market? Happy Memorial Day weekend. Thanks for being you. Um, well, we talked about this before, and I, I'm going to say that they fall into the same category of what we talked about before on the show, which is very few companies get to have the, the hold their value. You know, everyone has flukes. Everyone has, like I said, it's not the it's not the uh, standard, but it's just an exception to the rule. It's an exception. Um, but very few companies are going to hold value. Like Martins hold value. Okay, Taylors for the most part hold value. Then after that, just like electric guitars, it starts sloping off real fast. You know what I mean with the main brands, and that's what it becomes. That's what it becomes. It's the same thing. It's not a bad thing. It's nothing about the. Remember the having a poor resale value doesn't even mean anything about the quality. It doesn't it doesn't insinuate anything about the quality of an instrument? There are guitars with horrible resale values that I think are some of the best guitars made in the world, like Godin some of the best guitars ever made in the world and they don't hold value as much as other guitars that mean see it doesn't connect in any way it's not because it's because like i said it's it's you have a smaller group of people looking for that brand and uh and it's a supply demand issue because there's less people looking for it they they know they can get a deal they're going to work they're going to work you for a deal so um so that basically that's why i think uh, our, I just like to find comments. RRD says ovations are working guitars for working musicians. They do what they need to do. Absolutely. I would, I would definitely, I would consider ovations one, uh, definitely that statement is exactly correct to me. Uh, it's a working musician's guitar. I see so many times gigging, gigging musicians. They take abuse. They, they, uh, they, they sound good plugged in. They do the job. They're comfortable for the most part, you know, and so, yeah, but like I said, they're just not going to have the cash, you know, cachet that some of the premier brands have, have done that. Plus, also, another thing that really jacks up resale values is when companies change hands too many times. You got to understand Ovations now have been in three hands. So they're so the first they were Command and Command was the company that made them in Connecticut and Connecticut in Connecticut. Uh, uh, which also then at some point owned Hamer. So you had Hamer and Ovation. And then Command gets bought by Fender. So for a short time, Fender owned them. And uh, and then uh, then Ovation gets sold off. When Fender sells off Command, they they command they sell off a bunch of brands, and one of the brands goes sold Ovation. So that also, just like Guild Guitars, I think there's another brand that's hard to get uh, you know their due. And it's because... Now you got to think like, well, what ovation do you like? Do you like the ones that were made in Connecticut? Do you like the ones that were imported from manufacturers? Do you like the ones that, you know, for, well, for a brief moment, Fender had control of, do you like the new ones? And that really changes the resale values. And it also damages the brand to the hardcore guitar consumer. Cause then again, they become really specific. There's all this stuff, you know, you think it's, think of it as from Fender. Fender is basically been Fender this whole time. And even Fender, people are like, well, this is pre-CBS. <laughs> this is, right, there's different times what they focus on. Same with guitar, uh, Gibson, there's when there was good years and bad years. So imagine it gets a much more complicated when it's different companies owning those companies. So, uh, Smart Mamal hey says, Ovations were so popular in the 70s, 80s. Um, not only so popular, so expensive. Uh, I was an Ovation dealer and one of my trusted customers who was a gigging musician, I mean, he was a working musician. He would do 30 to 40 gigs every month and literally, you know, made a living feeding his kids, paying his mortgage, you know, gigging. And uh, he made a comment one day, he needed Ovation. He wore, you know, wore something out, broke something. He needed a new one. He came in, he was looking at them and I was like, oh, this one. And I think it was like $8.99. And he says, man, my first Ovation was $1,400. And I said, oh, yeah. And he goes, in the 70s. <laughs> and I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah. He's like, they're cheaper now than they were before. And I'm sure it's because they were imported now and those were made in Connecticut. But still, it's like, it's funny. They were they were a must-have thing. They also, in my opinion, Ovation also spawned, and I don't have any proof for this. There's no facts. It's just kind of in my mind. They also spawned some of the worst guitars in history, which is all of those thin body fenders and Kramer fakey plastic back 
<laughs> guitars. Um, oh, uh, I've owned a bunch of them. I think I told you this story. I like them. I like the idea of a small acoustic and how it plays and stuff. But I remember like one day I was playing my Strat acoustic, not the new ones, the acoustic song stuff, but the Strat acoustic. And it was the Fender one, not the Squire one. So just to give you a reference. And I remember playing it one night. And uh, my wife just, she's never done this ever. She stops me. She stops me and she goes, Can you please get rid of that guitar? <laughs> I remember. And then I thought, it was so serious and so weird that I thought, Oh, this, what is she, what's the point? This is a joke. And I go, Why? And she goes, It sounds so bad. Can you please just, I don't care what it costs. Can you please get something else? And I go, No, it sounds pretty good. It's a little acoustic, it's a little quiet. She goes, It just sounds like you're playing on a tin can. She goes, hey, can you please stop? And uh, I sold it, and I got a, oh, that's why I got the Golden A6. And then I played her the Golden A6, and she goes, oh, that's so much better. She's like, yeah, that ringing was killing my ears. <laughs> She's never done that. I mean, I've literally took guitars and fed back on my Marshall Hastack and just dot, whammy die, bar die for hours. She never said anything. And that one day at night, she's like, please, can you stop? <laughs> She's like, this is the worst thing I've ever heard. <laughs> so, so, uh, but so you know, for the record, I kind of still liked it <laughs> just a little bit, <laughs> but deep down, I also knew she's, she's right. She's right. And as we talked about before, you got to let the people in your house, they got to love the music you're playing. Otherwise they're never going to support you. They're not emotionally. They're never going to support it. If, if, you, if they're sighing when you're playing, I mean, it's part of all of our lives, but man, it's not going to go well. Meester says, Mr. Junior High Buddy designs t-shirts for Gallery Arcane Argenda, Punk Rock Bowling, etc. What? Okay. I get you some shirts, XXL, Best Attenuator. Okay, so I think he's telling me that he's got my my Mr. My Junior High Buddy. That's what I saw. I saw I saw instead of my junior, I saw Mr. Sorry. My Junior High Buddy, my Junior High Buddy designs t-shirts for his Gallery, Arcane Agenda. Oh, I know Arcane Agenda. I know that from somewhere. Um, punk Rock Bowling, etc. Uh, I'll get you some shirts. In a, oh, that would be, thank you. That would be awesome. Uh, I'll send you some shirts in exchange. Uh, it says, um, uh, so best attenuator for an orange TH30 combo, $600 less. Uh, the, uh, it's the Iron Man 2, get the 30 watt. Uh, one that thing is my favorite there's going to be a ton of comments in the in this in the in the comment section is the good ones because they're all really good there's a ton of them to own for sure the, the two notes one's good the, i mean there's so many good ones there's almost like no bad ones but that thing to me if you want your amp to sound exactly like it does uh non-attenuated that thing just does it and it's the iron man 2 and it's the 30 watt unit that uh, does 30 to 40 watts um absolutely love it for that and that price range you're talking about, 600 bucks. It's going to be under 600 bucks uh, by, I think it's like three, $400. It'd be cool. If you're tempted to get the more expensive one, uh, which is a, I bought one of the, I bought the 100 watt one for a video. What I learned was I only needed the 30 watt one. So that's just why I'm telling you that. One of the things I like about that one, here's what I like about it. I should just actually just take a step forward and tell you. Not only do I like how it sounds, how it works, the quality way it's made, but I also like the fact that unless you want to foot switch it because it's got a boost function, you don't even need power. And that I love the most. Although I have like the aux and I have a two notes and I have all these other ones, I have tons of them that plug in and do stuff. Um, and I like the Rock Crusher by Rivera, but I think the Iron Man 2 is superior, especially since you can find it for less money. Um, but what I like about it, like a lot of them, is you put it on top of your amp or next to your amp and you don't have to plug in anything, just leave it unplugged. It does its job. It sounds great. Uh, and again, that's the, and you know what? And again, since we're here and we can share. It's called the Iron Man 2 Mini. Oh, okay, there it is. Woo! And it's on sale for the uh, weekend and it's out of stock. But uh, if it's on sale here, this is Sweetwater. So, so you understand, so back to me. Um, I remember Boutique Amp Distribution sitting out an email saying that they were putting all their stuff on sale for the weekend. So all the pedals and the Synergy stuff and all these things, they're on sale. Why that matters is 
is that go back here on Sweetwater, you see the regular price is 395, so it's 335. This is cheaper, but it's out of stock. It doesn't matter. Every dealer will have it on sale. So just go find one in stock. This is it. 335. This is a perfect time. You got it. Um, I usually don't get all salesmen like you got to buy this, but trust me, if you get this and you hate it, I'll be shocked. I, I could probably use a backup. So if you get it and you hate it, you just email me and I'll buy it off you for what you paid for it. Cause I could probably get another one in my, in my rack and, and need it. But that's a good, that's a good attenuator for sure. For the price quality for sure. Um, Mike Goodman says, Phil, are there many humbuckers that sound like PAFs? Well, I don't believe so. There are many humbuckers, uh, obviously, like, obviously, Seymour Duncan makes, uh, you know, a little 59. There's a lot of mini PF style or mini pickups that will say they sound like PAF. I've done a shootout video, you know, mini humbucker versus full size humbucker. And, and of course, in that video, not only did I do the video, but I did hours and hours of research. And what I found was no, there's just no way. There's no way any mini humbucker sounds the same as a full-size humbucker. That doesn't mean they sound bad. I actually prefer them for a lot of things. Um, so I think you can get yourself a mini humbucker that sounds fantastic, whether you go with the mini uh, Firebird style size ones or if you go with the actual single coil size, size ones. Um, but they're not going to do the same thing because it's, it's a physical issue. It's just the physical range in which... The, the spacing they have, you know, um, but can you get close? Sure. You can get close. Any of the PAF style mini humbuckers out there are going to sound a percentage close to the full size PAF style pickup. So will you notice it? I don't think you'll notice a whole lot unless you do the comparative like I did, you know, you'll have to compare them and then all of a sudden you'll go, yeah, this is thinner and brighter. It's so really what it is. It's always gonna be a little brighter. And that might be something you want. Like I said, there might be something that appeals to you on that, but but if you're asking me, like, uh, I have a humbucker space and I want to put a small pickup in there while I lose anything, you're going to lose something. But if you don't have the option to put the full size in there, put the mini in there, it's going to sound good. Won't sound 100%, but it'll get you close enough to where, you know, close enough for rock and roll. <laughs> right? Okay. Um, John Doe says, I bought a, a Jaguar Lux. Jaguar. <laughs> <laughs> See what I was saying? I said Jaguar. I don't know why I said Jaguar. Everyone I know says Jaguar. One thing I will tell you is everyone, every time somebody says, oh, you say that different, I always laugh because I always immediately do the same thing. I go, I'll ask everyone I know. I'll say, I'll hold up. I just did it this week. I'll hold up the word on a card and I go, say this word. And they go, Jaguar. And I go, that's how I say it. <laughs> because it's, uh, it's how, it's your, it's your accent. It's just how you talk. It's just how you talk. Uh, Jaguar. Um, the, uh, the biggest thing was, the biggest thing ever happened on this channel, it was huge, massive thing, was I never knew that they called it Illinois. I always thought it was called Illinois. And one day I said Illinois on the podcast, and somebody says, Phil, it's not Illinois, it's Illinois. Because I said Illinois Nazis instead of Illinois Nazis from, obviously, my favorite movie of all time which is Blues, Blues Brothers, right? It's like Blues Brothers, Army of Darkness, right? Okay, so here's what's crazy. I, that weekend, I asked every single, I mean, every single person I know in my close proximity, family, my family, uh, I didn't, you know, my children, because they would have whatever bad habits I have, uh, but family, I asked Ralph, and I said, how do you, how do you say, and I said it, and they go, Illinois, and I go, it's not right, it's Illinois, and they go, What? And I go, how, how do we go our whole life and not know it's Illinois? <laughs> and then we got so obsessed with this. What we found is it's just like dumb people from Tucson, Arizona just say that, I guess. Uh, no offense to the people in Tucson because that's where I'm from, basically. So, yeah, you just, <laughs> Illinois. So, uh, Jaguar. <laughs> Anyways, back to Jaguar. I bought a Jaguar Lux. Unbelievable quality. The sound is great. Bought two 60th anniversary Red Jaguars, only 250 made, putting them away for the future. It's a good investment. Like I said, I reviewed that uh, Ultralux, and uh, that was a viewer uh, had reached out to me and said, hey, I want to buy this guitar. Can I send it to you? Um, and uh, he was a patron. And what happened was on that, if you notice I did the Kiesel, I did a couple. I had a few patrons reach out and say, uh, uh, say, hey, I, you know, 
uh, wouldn't it be cool to do some guitar view reviews like this? So I, I wanted to entertain that stuff. And so that's why I like, I like said, I like to do everything for the experience. It was really interesting to get to touch. There was a weirdness to it that I have to admit, it's kind of strange. It's strange touching a guitar that you know is going to somebody else. Like, it's like, it's, it's not only do you have to be super careful, which is your, I'm careful when it's a company's guitar, but it, super careful, but also it makes it really strange because I will tell you, I, I have found that I must, I must, must be something instinctive in me because <laughs> it's like I could mouth when it's a company's guitar. It's like I could mouth off about it. I'm like, Oh, I wouldn't have paid. I wouldn't have picked this color. Like, I feel like I critique it a little, not harsh, but I'll critique it. When they were viewers guitars, I found myself re-editing and editing and editing, forcing myself to finally say it the way I wanted to say it. Which, because every time I was kid gloving it, I was like, oh, it's, you know, uh, like that volume control I was not a fan of, of with that treble bleed. And in the original version, I'm like, yeah, it's, it's, I think I said, it, I go, it's not bad. And then I go, that's not what I really feel. I really feel like I don't like it. And, uh, and there's nothing wrong with it. So much of the guitar was great. And overall, I gave the guitar, I would give the guitar a nine and a half out of 10. So, you know, I'd be happy to own it. He's going to be happy to own it. Not everything's perfect, but it was funny when it's somebody's guitar, it's like, it's like you're over at their house and they made you dinner and you're like, oh, it's a little salty. And, but in your head, you're thinking, how is it? And they go, and you go, it's perfect. <laughs> and, um, my wife has learned how to, how to, uh, how to, uh, <laughs> my wife has learned how to how to detect my, uh, when you do that, when you're too, being nice. Um, how my wife does it is she, um, she'll ask me, uh, how was it? And I'll say, oh, it was really good. And she goes, so should I make it like that exactly next time? And I go, well, I would do it with less salt next time. <laughs> <laughs> but this time it was perfect this way, but next time less salt would be more perfect. So, um, <laughs> High Desert Hotel said you hated the bridge pickup. No, remember I liked the bridge pickup. I was not a fan of the neck pickup, uh, which was shocking to me. Again, uh, I wouldn't have changed those things. I, I wouldn't have paid to change those things. Like if it was my guitar, I wouldn't have uh, replaced them. But again, everything's got to you know have a have a great its greatness to it and a, a quirkiness to it. Um, but yeah, cool to know. Uh, like I said, those are those are cool. I like I said, I have essentially a Jaguar Jazz ma Jazz Master because I have the uh, Valiant guitar, and so that kind of definitely filled filled my need, filled the need. BX Games says I was fortunate enough to pick up a 1982 JCM 800 212 combo. Now, now I have to mess with you. When you say you're fortunate enough to pick one up, you mean because you're strong enough to lift it or because you found it and you were able to buy it because they are freaking heavy. 212 JCM 800 combos are rather, rather heavy. <laughs> I'm going to say he's, he's uh, fortunate enough to buy it and not just pick it up because you, you should be full fortunate. It's heavy. Okay. So it says, for the first time, I need an attenuator. Rock Crusher, if I am just a bedroom rock star. Uh, no, like I said, you just heard my recommendation. Like I said, I like the Rock Crusher, but you got to understand, the Rock Crusher, there's nothing wrong with the Rock Crusher. I had the Rock Crusher, rock crusher for years. I don't have it now because I switched to the Iron Man 2s. I just found them to be slightly better. Keep in mind, though, uh, you didn't say what wattage you have if you have 50 or 100 watts. So if you have 50, you might get away. You might want to double check, but you might get away with the Iron Man 2 Mini. Otherwise, you have to go with the full size. And if you saw the pricing, uh, I think it was 600 and dollars yeah 675 on sale look that was 675 on sale so that's quite a bit more than what you're going to probably find a rock crusher for um i thought they had the rock crusher listed here when i was looking just a second ago um but i would recommend the rock crusher still i just like i said i think the iron man stuff's just a little better um but the rock crusher is a good product there's nothing wrong with it quality wise nothing 100 percent. i would say it's 10 out of 10 quality. Sound-wise, it's an 8 out of 10, 8.5 out of 10, comparably to these other ones. So if you can get one and you can get one, especially for a good price, I would go with that. But otherwise, that's what I would recommend is the Iron Man's. Um, is the ones I like. And of course, there's tons out there, but I'm just telling you, showing you what I like. Kind of kind said, sup, Phil. Sup. Nathan Boone says, best budget, single cut guitar, and why doesn't Ibanez make more Iceman style guitars? Well, I'm sure it's because they're not selling. I mean, 
you know, the Iceman is a dated look from a very specific time. It's like, it, look, the Iceman, I think, is a cool looking guitar in the concept of, of, of now, right? What I mean by that is I consider the Iceman in the same league as a lot of the Beast Rich guitars, these cut, strange looking, odd shaped guitars. And they definitely had their heyday in the 70s and the 80s and they were killing it. And they still have a coolness to them now and I still like them, but they're just not where the market is correctly right now, right? The mar currently, the market currently right now is definitely into Les Paul Strats. Bo we're back to the boring guitars. <laughs> <laughs> no one's doing flashy uh, right now. So that's probably why they're not making a lot. They're not selling. Um, I can tell you when I was an Ibanez dealer, all of that stuff we pulled in, we'd pull in and just sit there and rot. And it would just die. And um, not for any particular reason, just it would die. So Kevin says, well, the Paul Gilbert plays the reverse Iceman. We had one of those in the store. Same thing. Took a while to sell. And not, not that that's bad. It just doesn't move as fast as certain common shapes, common things. So that's probably why. So... Um, but they still make them and you can find them all the time. They're really cool. I always deep down wanted a, uh, a white, um, Iceman. And, uh, every time I saw one, I, I just didn't, didn't click or didn't line up either. You know how it goes. No money. Found the great guitar money. Can't find the great guitar, you know, stuff like that always kind of lines up wrong. Um, but to your other part, uh, what's the best budget single coil or single cut guitar. That's what I think your best budget single cut guitar and why, uh, I'm going to give you a bunch that I like because you just said budget, but you didn't say what budget. First of all, I think the Ert single coil, uh, or single coil, sorry, the Ert single cut guitar at 379 is fantastic. It's fantastic. It's just like the other Ert I, re I reviewed. Uh, their, their quality is great. You guys all say the name sucks. I don't disagree, but I also, you're on a budget. Beggars can't be choosers. I mean, I would take beautiful fret work <laughs> over over a lot of things in a guitar. So uh, over the name, that's a great one. Um, I like the PRS SE single cuts a lot. I like the uh, Sire L7 single cut a lot. Again, it's tough because when we say budget, those guitars are now pushing six, seven, eight hundred dollars. So it's out of a a lot of budgets. Um, I'm trying to think of stuff that like look around, seeing if there's anything in particular especially anything I've played in the last year or two or three that I stuck out that earth, the earth stuff sticks out the most to me by far for the price and more so just like I said, and it's not a big deal. So, you know, earth is not amazing. It's slightly better than Harley Benton. It's slightly better than the other guys on the market. They're just putting a little bit more time. And I recognize what that time is. It's, it's about 30 to 40 minutes of fret labor. Is what's into those guitars, and that makes a big difference. The downfall so far has been pickups, although uh, we'll find out on the single cut, single cut or how much I like or dislike the pickups. But to me, if you're into a guitar for 300 and change and it's perfect, other than pickups, it seems like an easy thing to fix later. So those are something I would suggest. Um, other single cuts that are cool, obviously. Oh, LTD stuff. Oh man, fantastic. So there's a lot of stuff. Like I said, it gets it's. It's almost like we're getting to the point where you can't even ask, like, what's good? You got to go, like, what's bad? And then you go, okay, here's a couple things I would stay away from. Michael says, we wear black shirts for stage work, film, television, so we don't indirectly reflect light onto the set. That yellow shirt qualifies as its own light source. Here's a little towards Memorial Day weekend beer fun. You know, uh, funny story, I think I have the picture. Uh, do I have it? I feel bad if I don't have it. This is, uh, give me a second. It's 2019. So I got to go to 2019. If I have the picture real fast, I'll share it with you. If I don't have the picture, then unfortunately I don't, I don't have the picture. So here's what's funny. Uh, so let me just share the story without the picture. Unfortunately, I don't have the picture on my phone to share. I could have transferred over. Um, I was in uh, I was in Germany and um, for a YouTube event. There was a p bunch of channels there. There was a uh, Trey from Gear Gods. There was uh, Steve from Boston. There was Henning Polly was there. Um, you know, and I I don't uh, I don't want to miss anybody, but there's so many people there. Uh, Jalen or Jay. What's funny was they didn't they told us there was gonna be photos. They didn't say anything else. Then we were sitting on this these couches together. There's twenty of us channels, and they looked at us and they're like. 
okay, um, we can't take the pictures today. And we're like, why? And they go, well, because we're using a, ba- a black background and every single one of you, besides Henning Polly, of course, was wearing a black shirt. And they go, so tonight when you go to your rooms, you know, hotel room, um, come back tomorrow, wear a different color shirt. And all of us are like, all, all we have is black shirts. And, and they were in sh- the shock. The photographer was like, what? Like, no, no, bring a different shirt tomorrow. And we're like, yeah, all I have is, like all, all of us were like, all, all we have is black shirts. <laughs> So we had to take the pictures outside. Oh, I could probably show you. I could probably show you that. I think that because they did take a picture of us with the back, 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 black background, and it is exactly what I said. It looks like a bunch of floating heads. Um. Yeah. Look. Oh, check this out. Okay. Let me transfer it. It's just too too funny not to share. All right. Funny for me, not for you guys. Remember, this show is about entertaining me. Apparently. Okay. So, let me, I just transferred it to you guys, so you'll be able to see it in a second. Oh, yeah. Oh, Al Kafir was there. I God, I forgot how many people were there. Okay, let me share this with you guys. All right, here it is. So, as you can see, looking at this picture, there's Henning, if you couldn't figure out Henning, with the only shirt. They were like, <laughs> Jay had a white shirt under his black shirt, and they were like, they had this plan for Hughes and Kinder. We were all going to stand in front of this big black b- black backdrop. And they were like, yeah, uh, we can't do that. And so we had to take the picture outside because, as you can see, I am not the only one that defaults to the black shirt. <laughs> I just remember they were so aggravated with us. Like, they were in shock. They're like, you guys, literally none of you have anything other than a black shirt. And we're like, yeah, that's the way we roll. Like, everybody wear... Where's a black shirt? <laughs> See, Jeff, if I had this shirt, only Minnie and Henning could have been in the photo for that. All right, so, so that makes you appreciate, if you guys know Henning, you appreciate that Henning does not wear black. Um, he wears every color but black. Okay, so uh, we have, uh, I don't know how to say it. See a dud, Z, I don't know. I'll say uh, dud Z. Uh, says, what are my thoughts on Gretsch Streamliners? I had a Gretsch Streamliner for years. I did a video on it on the channel early on. Had it for years, loved it. Um, had a Streamliner, and then I had Electromatic, and I loved them absolutely. And then what happened was I got an opportunity to buy uh, a Gretsch Anniversary Main Japan uh, 6118. I think that's right. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I kind of had to let them all go to go to that. So I have to do one Gretsch now. But absolutely love them. Are they, is my Japanese one better? No, it's just, it was a limited edition. It was cool. It was everything about it I wanted. It's a smaller body. It's a junior. It's a 6118 junior. So that's it. But otherwise, yeah, I love the Streamliner. I think the Streamliners are some of the best deals on the market for hollow body guitars now. And I'm sure they priced up and I'll probably be in shock. Let's, in fact, let's look. Let's, let's do Phil reacts to inflation pricing. (laughs) Maybe that's what I should do. We should, I should just do a video where I just go on a website and look up prices on things and then just react. Okay, ready? Uh, oh, you know, okay. So let, let me, okay, I'm gonna react right now. So this Streamliner is 650. I'm not shocked. Keep in mind though, that not very long ago, we're talking 2015-ish, you could, pr- you could buy Maybe 2013. So 2013, you could buy a, uh, a Electromatic uh, with these features for about $699 to $799. So that's about the price there. And the Streamliner was $499 to $549. So I'm not really shocked to see it. Uh, I was thinking they were going to be $550 to $599 for sure. So $650, I wow. mean, it's not horrible. And for the price, this is a lot of guitar for the money. Um, and it's, uh, it's got the Bigsby style bridge. It's got, uh, the better looking Filtertron copy-esque pickups that look good. And, um, so that's not bad. 650. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's a pretty decent guitar for the price point for a Gretsch. So, and it's got the Gretsch vibes, it's got Gretsch mojo. And you can understand there's, there's a lot of thought put into Gretsch. Joe Carducci is the guy who runs Gretsch. Joe Carducci is one of the original 12 Fender employees that, moved over from CVS to the new current Fender regime of companies, right? When, uh, and, um, and Joe Carducci, when Fender, um, acquired the rights to sell Gretsch in 2001 or three, so somewhere on there, 
2001 to 2003. I can't remember the exact year. Um, when they did that, uh, Joe was put in charge of Gretsch, and he's run Gretsch ever uh, ever since. And if anyone, any of you, one of you are in, into Gretsch's and never been to a Gretsch, Gretsch event, a Gretsch event, you have met Joe Carducci. And Joe takes his job like so serious, and he is so honest and good about what he does. And so whenever he makes a line of guitars for Gretsch, whether it's the streamers or the electromatics, so much thought is not only just put into, you know, is it a good guitar? That's important. But how does it, how does it place itself? Like he doesn't go like, okay, here's the expensive one. It's three grand. Let's make a $900 one. And then people can afford it. It's never that it's how do you make someone who has a $3,000 guitar want the $901 one and the $600 one by making them similar, but different. So the streamliners have a slightly different pickup sound and a, and a vibe to them than the others. It's, it's less Gretchy, but that's actually a positive thing because Gretches are really bright, jangly. That's a cool sound, but sometimes people don't want that sound. So the streamliners are a little bit darker, fuller sounding versions, kind of like a Gibson meets a Gretsch is kind of how I'd kind of describe it. Electromatic, a little bit more like the twang Gretsch kind of thing, and then full on Gretsch twang when you go to the sound, uh, to the big guitars. And that doesn't mean you can't get the Gretsch sounds out of the other models, but it is, like I said, there is thought put into that. Even those pickups, I believe those pickups were chosen, I think because he said there was like a Baldwin era pickup when Baldwin uh, owned Gretsch that they found. They found this pickup and it was just this weird pickup that they had in a model for a few years and they said, let's re replicate it and put it in these guitars. So, very cool. Okay, Avi Bus, Avi Bos says, how awesome would a PRS24 uh, uh, Piazzo be? They have, no, they have a custom 24 Piazzo core. I think it'd be cool. 2408 with Piazzo would be awesome, especially an S2. Because <laughs> that's, you know, the S2s are expensive. I mean, S2s, at this point, uh, like the S2 behind me, this is 2408 S2 thin line. At this point, I'm an S2 player. I, I just, you know, uh, the cores are just, psh, they're out of my... They're out of my comfort zone. I'm not buying those for me personally. I'll, I'll review them. I'll do them on the channel. I'll check them out. I get to experience them. I own a couple. That's kind of why they're out of my range right now is because, you know, there's no justification. I'm not going to have a bunch of those. And I like the, the S2s. I like, like I said, I like guitars that feel good. They're, they they kind of kind of feel expensive, uh, you know, so you feel like, okay, this is cool. Um, they sound great. They play great. And if I nick it, I'm not freaking out on an epic level because I just lost you know, two months wages, <laughs> something like that. So Matt Field says, amp guy here about the reverb tank. Try flipping it to 180 IE. If the RCA jacks are facing towards the back, flip it so they face the baffle. Oh, okay. So, okay. Flip it 180. Um, so good suggestion. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate that. Uh, Robert says, hey, Phil, thoughts on the quality Japanese lawsuit, Les Paul's Got, in 19, got a 1978 Greco EG700 and love it, but I wonder if it's, excuse me, I wonder if it's an outlier. If not, I need more of them. Um, I have worked on so many what's called lawsuit era guitars. They're not technically lawsuit eras because there was never a lawsuit. It was just a cease and desist and they did. <laughs> but we refer to them as lawsuit. So, you know, I only say that because uh, the person who was involved in defending Ibanez, the attorney, who's also an attorney who's won the case for against Fender for getting the the body shapes in the public domain. I guys, I told you guys, I've I've talked to him a few times, and I brought up a lawsuit guitars, and he goes, "Well, it wasn't a lawsuit. We didn't get sued. We just got a cease and desist, and we complied." And I said, "Oh," and then I, I'm telling you the story because I want to tell you what I said. Uh, and I said, "Yeah, but to all of us normal people, that's like if I get a cease and desist letter, I'm being sued." And he goes, "No, it's not a suit." And I and I go, "Yeah." But to me, it's going to feel like it. <laughs> and I think that's relatable to most people. Like, if you get a legal... If, you, if I get a letter from an attorney, I think I'm getting sued. So, uh, back to what I'm saying. Uh, so, I've, I've worked on so many of them in the years. I even recently worked on a couple. I did the Tone King. He got a 1973 uh, Ibanez lawsuit era guitar. I put uh, new pickups in it and stuff. And cleaned it up and, and polished his frets and stuff for him. And... Um, it was very good. I like them. However, 
again, there's a there's a coolness to them for the time period. There's all these, you know, it's made in Japan. That's kind of cool vibe. There's a lot of coolness to them. But quality wise, although I found a lot of them to be quality, I don't find most of them to be much more quality than you can get for something that's less priced now made in Korea or Indonesia. In fact, I, I did a, a video years and years and years ago where it's got me all kinds of fluffy, lovey uh, comments. That's sarcasm where I basically implied that most of the Korean guitars today, uh, which back then, <laughs> and uh, even Indonesian guitars now, are built as well as Japanese and a fraction of the price. And my logic for that was I was explaining that, you know, in the late 90s, uh, you could buy a made in Japan guitar for $1,000 that was bolt-on, but now you can buy a made in Korea guitar um, for $1,000 now. And... It's a set neck, and it, or it's a neck through, and it has more features. And there's a lot of things I like about those guitars. So I like those guitars. I think it's not that I think you got a perfect or a, you know a unique one. I think there's a lot of great ones out there. There's more good ones than bad ones, but there are bad ones, mostly because they get played to death. The thing about those guitars that is tough, it's not about how they're built, and it's not about their you know uh, the specifications. It's that you got to understand most of the players that bought them bought them because either they can afford them or they wanted to use them. And so what I notice is whenever you see anything that's like a lawsuit era guitar, it has been played. The frets are worn down. Everything is worn off. I mean, it's been played. Those guitars were played. It really shows even back then, nothing's really changed, right? The players, the people out there doing it, played inexpensive versions of expensive guitars. Nothing's changed. I, I always hear now people are like, oh, only the collectors buy the expensive ones. Nope, it was like that forever ago. Very rarely did the guy who was playing, you know, Bo Billy Bob's <laughs> uh, barbecue and, and shitting in I don't know, I got no jokes, I'm sorry. Uh, every Saturday, did he pull out the custom shop Les Paul? It's just, it just wasn't as common even then. It's just not very common. Uh, what was really common is a lot of off brands. It's why, and here's the proof of that. Uh, PV didn't make a its entire brand off of off of hobbyists and collectors. It made itself off working musicians. PV is a brand. It's kind of what kills PV too, is that it built itself on the fact that if you needed to make money and work as a band, you can't afford to have your gear in the shop. You can't afford to, to have to fix it. You can't afford for it to break and you can't afford to, for it to be expensive. That's kind of where they came in and said, we'll, we'll make that. We can make you a PA that's loud and it's not a crazy expensive. We can make you a guitar amp that's going to do what Fenders do and other amps do. And it's again, not going to be as expensive, but it lasts. There was a whole mentality to give product to working musicians. Working musicians, it's not that... Eh, there's a ton of things that hurt working musicians over the years, but the biggest thing that hurt them more than anything else was uh, places where musicians play, like bars and restaurants, are generally cheap. They're cheap people. They're, there's nothing bad about that. And by the way, they're just like, why pay a band if I can plump it in with music? And, 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 the, and the biggest testimony of that of all times is is uh, this. I was just in a bar uh, in the last week <laughs> and I made a joke to some friends because I went in a bar and it was nothing but TV screens. And I started laughing and I said, remember when bars had dartboards, live bands, and pool tables? I'm not that old. I'm, I mean, it's not like the whole world changed. Now I go, you know what's funny? This bar looks like my house. It's got a big TV playing in the background. <laughs> right? That's it. I'm like, you know, I wanted to come here because there's pool, there's darts, and there's a band. And then now there's none of that stuff because you know why? 40 flat screen TVs cost nothing. So stick them everywhere and pump in stuff. And I don't even, it wasn't a sports bar. Well, I think it was. But it's not even about sports bars. They, they do it no matter where you go. They pump in, you know, they pump in freaking sitcoms. <laughs> you sit there and they're playing a TV show. And you're like, this is the weirdest experience. So, so that's kind of the logic there. I guess, uh, is that those guitars, so that's my way of saying those guitars got played a lot. And so that's what's hard about finding good ones is you got to find ones that don't need a ton of work. You can find really good guitars like those in the modern world that are re more recent, that are just as good. They're not going to have the cool factor. They don't have the story and they're not going to hold value and resell value as strong. But other than that, uh, that's the main reason you get them is because like you, 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 like you said, you, you, look at the story. We have something to talk about. If you you know, if you said, hey, Phil, I bought a Harley Benton Les Paul guitar today. What do you think? And I'd be like, they're pretty good. <laughs> There'd be no story about bars, no story 
<laughs> about players over the years. None of that stuff. That's what's cool about some things. Some things just have nostalgia or they have a cool factor or they have something that we can talk about. And that's cool too. Um, Amistra says the Iron Man two will do. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Uh, like I said, let me know what you think of it. Um, okay. All right. We hold on a second. I don't even know if you can hear that. It's far away from the mic. Okay, uh, let's see. We have Richard who says, to all those that have served our country and those who made the ultimate sacrifice, you will not be forgotten on this Memorial Day weekend. I appreciate that, Richard, for saying that. You know, one of the things I've talked about, we talked about this in the last couple of Memorial Days on the show um, that happened Memorial Day weekends, is Memorial Day, I always remind people, I always, always have to remind friends of this too, Memorial Day and Veterans Day are two different things. Veterans Day is where we, we basically uh, honor people who have served. And Memorial Day is where we remember the people that will never be able to be with their families again, and their families will never be able to be with them again. And that's, to your statement, the ultimate sacrifice. And so that's what Memorial Day is, is this, and that's what this weekend's really about. It's about honoring the people, no matter where you are in the world, you know, um, the people that are, like he said, perfectly uh, giving the ultimate sacrifice. And so I always say that because um, it's confusing to, to, it's not confusing to military people. They understand the concept because everybody in the military, no matter what you did, I turn wrenches. So you're like, you know, you're like, I understand, I understand turning wrenches like a thing. And I did that. And then somebody goes, thank you for your service. And I go, okay, you're welcome. I kept the trucks running. And then there's somebody who's like was in the in the shit. And then like that's real. And then there's somebody who's in a war and that's even more real. You know what I mean? And then and then then somebody lost their life. So it's really about that. It's about the layers and levels of which we show our appreciation for not just for the service and not just for the um the uh oh I hate it when I'm at a loss of words. I'm sorry guys. Um for the sacrifice. But exactly like you said, the ultimate sacrifice. There's, there's, there's definitely layers to giving sacrifice, and we want to give the most, the people who gave the most this weekend. So thank you for that. Uh, I always like that because I always like to talk about that when I can. Uh, Crankshaft said, uh, new amp day, Mesa Boogie F50. I was fortunate to be able to pick it up. <laughs> Abby is my twin. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's great that's great I'm, I'm glad you i'm glad he's carrying on the joke of a heavy amps okay so uh everybody crankshaft can lift the uh the f50 amp which is a heavy amp yeah he's a heavy as a twin so it's probably 70 pounds 70 something pounds haven't plugged it in yet wife's making me clean the basement well you know you know it's a small sacrifice to make to have a great amplifier Plus, once the basement's uh, clean, then you get to crank that thing. Wear earplugs. That's uh, my only suggestion, everybody. Ear filters. Get ear filters uh, if you don't have them. Uh, in fact, good. since we're doing stuff, this is a good time to say this since we're getting towards the end of the show. Always, always, always get ear filters. Uh, all of you should own them. Everybody should own them. Um, I've mentioned them many times over the years on the channel. And, uh, and, uh. Hold on a second. Let's see if I can find some. Nope. Um, if you don't know what I'm saying, because sometimes when I say ear filters, people think of earplugs. You can use earplugs. You can just use the phones and stick in your ear. But they make ear filters. I use the Daddario ones. I have Fender ones. There's a ton of company ones. I think uh, Skull Candy makes some that I have. I have all kinds because I have them everywhere. They're in my car. Well, they're in my son's car. They're, they're in my drawers. Uh, they're in backpacks. They're in gig bags. Um, ear filters are great because they'll reduce about 10 to 12 decibels decibels and it works it perfect and and why i say that is because sometimes you guys are playing and you're like oh i'm in my house and i've been at rock concerts i don't need earplugs well you do and and i understand the earplugs suck because you know it's it's kind of changes the sound and makes everything hard to hear but you can uh somebody says uh, serious says eargasms another great one as well um just google ear filters and you'll see it'll say some will reduce up to 15 decibels some up to 12 some you know, right, decibels. And what I love about them is they work differently 
you plug them in your ears and instead of feeling like somebody shoved cotton in your ears, um, you still hear normally. It just reduces that and, and lessens the potential for ear damage and you still need them. So that's why I'm, you know, it's just a good time to bring that up. You, you know, it's uh, the, uh, if it's too loud, you're too old thing was a dumb thing to say that we all said. And uh, now some of us are fortunate like me to not have any tinnitus or anything like that, but a lot of people do. And, uh, and, uh, I lucked out, you know, being around big tanks and trucks and then being around rock music and music all my life. I don't know how I didn't get you know, anything, but I wore air protection, air protection as much as I could, but even then I didn't do it as much as I should have. Uh, I solo guitar. I think you're going to be the last one. Let's see. I solo guitar is the last question. He says, Phil own ever wait, Phil. Ever play or fix any Ibanez Ghost Rider guitars from the 90s? What were your impressions? If so, I don't see them. Really? Ghost Rider guitars from Ibanez? So I don't think I ever have. However, let me look because I have like all the Ibanez history books. There's two of them, I think. Oh, yeah, I've seen this. I just never really like noticed the name. Um, oh, you know what's funny about this is? Let me, let me find one. So I can share one with you guys. So here's one with P90s. They have some with humbuckers, you can see. Here's one with some humbuckers. Um, I remember these guitars. Uh, I remember they always had the Hamer vibe. Like, to me, there was like a Hamer, PRS kind of vibe. Now people would probably associate them probably Schecter's more than anything else. Um, never played one. I don't think I ever even worked on one. But I remember seeing them at some point, probably in the magazines or in the books, and just remember thinking, like, Hamer. What people don't understand, you know, PRS, Paul... Smith, Paul Ward Smith gets so much credit for so much stuff in these that look, this this look. And and of course we all know that Gibson had it and stuff, but people really don't understand. Like Paul, like he he admired Hamer guitars. Like, you know, I mean he was you know, Hamer guitars was the thing. They were it's one of those weird things that happens in life where Hamer guitars really, in my opinion, like spawns where PRS comes from. They they basically are just riding that wave because Hamer just got popular for a blip. Right. There was there was. And because so, some people don't even realize Hamer, they, they kind of saw the Hamer when Hamer copied ESP guitars and Jackson's. Right. So you saw some Hamers and they were like that shreddy Jackson stuff, Jackson uh, kind of guitars. But Hamer had was the first, in my opinion, to have those elegant carve. I guess that's what I'll call it. That's what I call PRS, like this elegant carve. Uh, look to them and you can feel this idea that you know it's it's like classy you know i, I guess that's the way it, it, it goes for it's why some people don't like it some people will call it pretentious i uh, i find myself even referring to classy things as pretentious because this is how it is so to me i can understand where you ha you know if you think it's pretentious you don't like it if you think it's classy and you like that you kind of like it um but uh so when i just did that it kind of makes sense around that time i mean that's when you know uh, to me the late 90s uh, what was it? year was that one? It was a 95, right? Yeah, 95. I mean, you, you, I want to go back. Just want to make sure. Yep, 95. And then your question, you were saying, what years were they? Year from the 90s. That was all the weird years. Like, you remember they did a, I mean, it's the Tolman guitars. Um, because all of those 80 shred guitars were dead. <laughs> they were just dead. And we didn't, you know, as an industry, they didn't know what to do. So they started going to anything. And that's one of the looks. So, I've never had one. I uh, never worked on one. I've worked on newer versions of whatever stuff that looks like that from Ibanez. That's a less expensive stuff, but I've seen them before. Very cool, very cool stuff. I kind of sometimes wish Ibanez would have really leaned into that stuff too hard. I always feel like Ibanez is a, a company. They they knock. They, they're a weird company in the idea they knock a couple guitars out of the park. Like they get the they get the RGs going, and which is the gems, and it just like takes off and it becomes a thing. And you know, and they get a couple guitars here and there that take off. And then they come up with some guitars that I think are actually kind of cool. You know, like we were talking about the Iceman earlier. And they're so quick to go, eh, it's not selling, just done. <laughs> let's make something else new. And they are the, let's make something new. Let's make something new. But sometimes you have to wonder, or at least I wonder, how many guitars become popular just from the consistency of them being around. For instance, the Strat, the Les Paul, the Rickenbacker. Um, uh, Rickenbacker, sorry. Uh, how many guitars like that don't get changed that stick around forever? How many of them end up in players' hands? Because, I mean, I, I, I I'll honestly tell you this: Fender is a company who wore me out. 
Uh, I n- had never, ever thought a Fender Strat looked cool. When I was younger, it was not, you know, something I thought looked cool. It wasn't anything I aspired to have. And over time, this thing that I thought was not literally that interesting looking just became cooler and cooler to the point where like all of a sudden I was like, oh, I think the headstock looks great. But I have no idea, probably just because familiarity of just it being around. So I always think that's when Ibanez is one of their downfalls is that they are cool because they come up with new stuff a lot. But sometimes I wish like like that stuff, maybe if they just stuck with it, keep going and going and going, even if the sales are low, just don't produce a whole lot of them. But then they'll take off, you know, because you never know. All right. On that note, I'm going to let you guys go. Thank you guys so much for joining me for the podcast, especially today's podcast. Thank you, Jeff, for the McKnight Trucking t-shirt. And just don't forget, <laughs> we, we take big dumps. That's just for you, Jeff. I broke that the rule of comedy three for that. Anyways, as always, guys, have a great uh, Memorial weekend. Be safe, especially be safe out there. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and to try, like I said, take it, take some time to remember those that gave you the ultimate sacrifice and then enjoy the people that are around your life because somebody made it possible for you to do that. And, uh, and we'll, we'll leave on that note as always, guys, thank you so much for your time till next Friday. Know your gear. <laughs>